Three, two, one. Okay, I think we're live. Let's just check real quick. Live with an ad. Oh, you, Anger. You got the ad? Yep. Uh, Alright, well... This is, this is your ad for Ad Blocker Plus. The only ad you'll ever need to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I might have to change that setting. I'm not sure. Alright, here we go. Uh, no worries. I can see your desktop now. Okay. No, we need, we need to monetize you. Hey, you know that money that I spend to go on road trips doesn't grow on trees. You need better trees. My money grows on trees. My parents had a money tree when I was a kid, so yeah. <laughs> you kill it. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another special webinar presentation here on Roadway Wiz. It's great to have you with us. Uh, tonight, we're going to do something a little different. Um, if you were with us last year, we did a special series of webinars on the bridges of the Delaware River. And I know that a lot of you guys out there enjoyed that. So I decided I would do something like that again. But the real motivation for doing this particular episode on suspension bridges in the United States was because back in July, I was out in the Pacific Northwest and I got to visit the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. And after that visit, I realized that I had been to the 10 longest suspension bridges in the U.S. by main span length. So with that in mind, um, I decided that this kind of episode will be a good one to do at some point, and so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to take you through, well, we'll go through the outline here in just a couple of minutes, but uh, I'd like to introduce you to the folks who are joining us tonight. Everybody is joining us via Skype, so let's say hello to these three fine people. We've got um, Steve and Erica with us from northern New Jersey. Hi to you both. Howdy. Hello. And uh, joining us from beautiful Washington, D.C. is Mike. Hi, Mike. Hello. Just, uh, you're, you're in your uh, Christmas best, I see, as far as attire. Yes, well, Mike Tantillo, uh, my nickname is Tanta Claus, so. That's very appropriate. <laughs> very Christmas, happy holidays to everyone. Happy holidays no. to everybody. On our end, we're just doing the American Gothic thing, and I'll get the pitchfork. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the, the four of us, if you put us all together, we are, you know, we are all engineers of some form or another. And so I felt like having the four of us do this presentation, I feel like, uh, we're certainly more than a little qualified, I guess, but you know, we're going to try to make our way through this slideshow and we'll see what we can do with it. Uh, what do you guys think? Okay, I don't, a rowdy, I don't like it. rowdy response from you guys. Okay, very nice. <laughs> We're stuck. We're stuck here. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So we got a lot of ground to cover tonight, and uh, not a lot of time to do it. So let's get right to it here with some announcements for the channel. Um, oh. YouTube uploads, if you've been following me lately, you know that I've been uploading a bunch of stuff from South Carolina, um, and expect that to continue uh, in the next few months. Actually, you're going to start to see a lot of stuff from North Carolina, so if, you, if you've been looking forward to some North Carolina videos, I think you're going to see a lot of that through the end of February. I've actually scheduled videos all the way through February 28th. Um, it's all Carolina stuff, so you're gonna get your you're gonna get your fill by the end of February. You're gonna not be able to stand it anymore. I think. Um, you see our season three schedule here, down below. Here we are. That's where we were last week, and that's where we're gonna be in the next few weeks. Looking forward to that double header day, by the way, on New Year's Day. That's gonna be interesting. 
<laughs> um, there's some other bridge related news here. I know this is a bridge webinar, so I thought I would bring this up. Um, while I have a minute here, as I as I think some of you know, I'm a I'm an engineer in the construction realm, and uh, we just opened this bridge this week in Westchester County, New York, near the town of Elmsford. Uh, this bridge was built um, starting in early August this year, and we opened it on December sixth. So we made we made pretty quick work of this thing. It took us about four months. Um, so it is open to traffic. There is still a decent amount of work still to go with this contract that will be picked up and completed in the spring. But the biggest objective for this year was the completion of the bridge, which I'm happy to report was uh, successfully achieved. And is the roundabout canceled? Uh, the, the roundabout is not canceled. Um, That's, that makes me angry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well... They're, they're, we're saving the roundabout for last on this project. But uh, there you see it. It's, you know, it's it's a bridge. It's nothing special. You know, it's your standard highway overpass, but they all count for something. All right, so to give you a little bit of an overview of what to expect tonight... Um, this presentation is going to be broken down into four parts. I've highlighted them here at the top of this slide. Um, I, I would like for this presentation to be, you know, um, worthwhile to people who are, whether they are beginners or they're experts as far as bridge, bridge design, bridge construction, and terminology are concerned. So I'm going to start by giving everybody a little bit of a, an introduction, maybe a little bit of a crash course. And then we'll get into some honorable mention suspension bridges, suspension bridges that are maybe not the longest in America, but they're among, or either they were among the longest or, um, or they're significant in some other way, historically. Um, and then we'll kind of go through the timeline of the longest bridges in the United States of that type. And we'll wrap up with a look at the top 10 longest spans in the US. I've put these uh, additional resources at the bottom of the slide for you. Uh, these are really just for websites. I mean, there are so many more that are devoted to the history and documentation of bridges across the U.S. I picked these four because I use them by far the most often um, during my research into this presentation. So. Um, there's a heck of a lot of useful information on those sites. I definitely recommend that you check them out if you haven't done so already. <clears throat> what about Alps Roads? No, sorry, I didn't. I didn't use your site. Sorry. That makes me angry. <laughs> Legit angry. Yeah, I'll bet. Um, but you've you've covered most of these bridges in your travels, right, Steve? I, I have I would have photos of just about all of them I and some of the history and I I do indeed use the additional sources that you cite for those so I understand yeah <clears throat> yeah so definitely check out those sites and um, I don't know let's take off for some with some terminology now I'm going to go on the assumption on this slide that everyone who is watching this has never seen a suspension bridge before in their life and they're they're wondering what in god's name is a suspension bridge well true this is a pretty good breakdown of the terminology that you'll come across most often i'm gonna break out my pen here for a second here because there are a couple of things i want to highlight um so you've got your i don't think this is working right is this working right? Yeah, it is working right. Hang on. I got to do this a little differently here. Okay. So you've got your anchorages here on each end, right? And you've got your your main towers here, right? The main cable is the cable that starts in the anchorage and goes up over the towers like this. 
I know I'm drawing terribly here, but you know, bear with me. So most suspension bridges have three suspended spans. The one in the middle, it's listed on here as a suspended span, but you will also frequently hear this span referred to as the main span. Okay, so when we're talking tonight about you know main spans and suspension bridges, this is the span that we're talking about. We're talking about this distance here. Okay. As as in quick aside, I know on offhand the one that comes to mind. I'm sure we'll be featuring on here. I won't give it away. But do you know how many bridges have multiple main spans? Well, I know there's there's at least one that we're going to deal with yes. tonight that has that claim. It's not very often that you see that. Um, as I said. Most, what do you think, Steve? Maybe at least ninety percent of suspension bridges look something like this, right? Yeah. The what? Other than the one that I know we're going to be featuring shortly, the other ones that come to mind are hybrids with suspension cables, but also other bridge types at play, and uh, they're all uh, less than fifty miles from the, from all of us here. So, yeah, yeah that's true. Really, you. Well, we'll talk about... Well, I have something I want to say about that bridge, but we'll talk about it when we get there. Um, and, and then maybe a, maybe a quick honorable mention to the Ambassador Bridge between Detroit, uh, Michigan, and Windsor, Ontario, which only has one suspended span in between the towers. Um, the suspended parentheses anchor span, uh, there are no vertical suspender cables on that particular bridge. So that's kind of a unique suspension bridge. And not one that we're going to cover tonight, I believe. Well, actually, you'd be wrong, Mr. T, because actually that is on our list. But Oops. But... <laughs> this is why I'm remaining silent here. Why you should pre watch the slides. Yeah. No, there's a, there's a bunch on the list. But uh, we'll start. Excuse me. Now that we've got uh, terminology figured out here, um, let's talk about some honorable mentions here. And... I picked these out. None of these on the list have ever been the world's longest, as far as I can tell, for span length. But they are pretty significant uh, domestically for their engineering significance. Um, is there anything that jumps off the page at you guys at this list before we dive into each one? Anything you want to say about them off the bat? I guess not. Okay. Thinking about it. <laughs> now, is Ro Roebling, I believe, the first one is the suspension cables are completely enclosed within wood framing. You cannot see as a visitor how it how it's actually put together. So, oh, interesting. Yeah. I guess I guess this is what we're doing now. So okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not really. Um, so the history of this bridge is kind of interesting because it's undergone really drastic changes in its appearance at least a couple times in its history. Um, the Delaware Aqueduct spans the uh, Delaware River, um, the Upper Delaware River near Menacing Ford. It was part of the Delaware and Hudson Canal built in the 1840s. Um, this bridge was engineered by John Roebling, which is why it carries his name today. It was a great early achievement for him in his career, really a stepping stone to bridges that he would design and build later, specifically at Niagara Falls and Cincinnati and New York City. Um, this bridge began its life as an aqueduct bridge, so it, it basically was a, you know, the tub that you see today was full of water and it had boats run it up and down it uh, as part of the canal. The canal went out of service in the late 1800s. Uh, the bridge was repurposed for vehicle traffic, at which point the original aqueduct infrastructure was stripped away and replaced with a standard road deck. And then much later on, the aqueduct you know, architecture came back, and this, and this replica of it is what we see today. But most of the original structure is still there. Um, the aqueduct stuff that you see now is, is obviously not original. 
Um, to me, it's it seems it, it's okay. You know, it seems to be more like a replica of the original than an original bridge itself. Um, it's more of a showpiece or a or a you know historic landmark or something like that. It, it I I don't know. I I think it's okay for what it is, but it doesn't really capture the original appearance of the structure. Although it does with the replica, it does retain a lot of those features. My panel is very quiet tonight. I, I'm busy arguing with people in chat. Well, it's my... well, you you should delegate somebody else to do that because you know it. It's okay if you if you talk every once in a while. I'm not the bridge engineer. Erica needs to talk more. Well, I don't know much. I don't do suspension bridges. <laughs> Why do you invite us? Jeez. I, I've run across the Manhattan Bridge though. There's something. <laughs> yeah, you people are useless. My God. You get some really nice views of the Brooklyn Bridge off, I think it was off the Manhattan Bridge. Yeah, yeah, there's a great picture. I, it actually might be in this slideshow. I don't remember if I put it in, but it was taken from the Manhattan Bridge. Um, <laughs> yeah, as I said, I've got some nice ones I could have shared with you. Yeah, you could have, you know. <laughs> um, the Manhattan, I put this one in here because the Manhattan is my personal favorite of the Lower East River suspension bridges. There's a cluster of three. There's the Brooklyn, the Manhattan, and the Williamsburg. We're going to talk about the other two coming up, but for me, the Manhattan has always been my favorite of the three. Um, I, I just like the appearance of the towers. I like the color of it, the blue color. Um, and it's just a neat bridge to look at. Um, and this picture on the right side of the screen, uh, taken in Brooklyn, this is one of the more iconic bridge-related photo locations in the city of New York. Um, as you can see in the picture, there are plenty of other people taking advantage of that shot, looking down the street at the uh, at the Brooklyn Tower of the bridge. You you can't go to New York City and have an Instagram account and not take that picture. Yeah, everybody's got that picture in their uh, portfolio, I, I think, right? I can confirm that that is false. I do not actually have a picture of that bridge in my Instagram either. Yep, sorry. Yeah, neither do I. It's on my Facebook, though, so that counts right. Uh, well, one of the cool things about the Manhattan Bridge is that it not only carries vehicles, but it carries subway trains, too. There are actually two subway lines that run over the bridge. The uh, There's connection to the Broadway line, and there's a connection to the 6th Avenue line as well. And for quite a few years in, I want to say from the early 1990s until the early 2000s, only one of the two was open at any given time because they were reconstructing the bridge due to uh, New York City. They, they weren't the best in terms of maintenance in the 1970s and the 1980s. So both this bridge and the Williamsburg both underwent some pretty significant reconstruction uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s. The reason I do not count Manhattan as, as one of my favorite bridges is because it's very unuseful for someone from New Jersey. If I'm going to southern Long Island, the Brooklyn Bridge is much easier to get to. I'm going to uh, central to northern Long Island, I can use the Williamsburg Bridge and very easily head towards the LIE that way. So Manhattan Bridge, I pretty much would have to be going right to the other end in Brooklyn for it to be any use for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I used to disagree with times. you, Steve. I used to use the Brooklyn Bridge all the time when I was uh, driving onto and off of Long Island as a poor college student. And the reason is because approaching the Holland Tunnel from the Brooklyn Bridge is a lot easier than from the Manhattan or the Williamsburg because you're approaching it from... Uh, north south streets as opposed yep. to trying to drive cross town. Yep. Just my opinion. <clears throat> of course, that wouldn't work now that they've um, taken lanes away on the BQE and made a permanent perpetual traffic jam right by the Brooklyn Bridge. The, the only times I've used the Manhattan Bridge has been if I've been seeing someone in Brooklyn, at which point it becomes a convenient way across. And invariably, on a weekend night, it is jammed 
it takes about 20 minutes to get off the base of the bridge into Manhattan. And then, as you said, you have to get all the way across from there. So definitely not my, my preferred choice. It's also kind of scary when you walk across it because all those trains that you mentioned create a lot more vibrations than you would have expected. Yeah, there, there are videos out there on YouTube of the, uh, the Manhattan Bridge deck like deflecting in one direction when a subway train is on it. It's, it's, really, it's really interesting stuff. So that's actually one of the reasons why the bridge deteriorated so much was that before what's called the Christie Street connection, where they connected one of the subway lines to the Sixth Avenue uh, line, and the so the north side is connected to Sixth Avenue, the south side is connected to Broadway. It used to be that the north side was connected to Broadway, and the south side was connected to what's called the Nassau Street Loop. So trains would come from to Canal Avenue in Brooklyn, go over the bridge, basically loop through Lower Manhattan and come back out through one of the tunnels. But in the 1950s and 1960s, when the like primary central business district of Manhattan moved from downtown to Midtown, given the Midtown office boom, uh, no one was using the Nassau Street Loop and they weren't running nearly as many trains. So the number of trains crossing the bridge, it was lopsided a lot more trains on the north side and that actually that lopsidedness caused some significant de deterioration of the bridge but that was rectified when they cut the nassau street loop moved broadway out to the south side and then connected um the sixth avenue line to the north side at that point then both uh sets of tracks went into midtown where most people want to go all right quickly let's move on um You've been looking at pictures of the Mid-Hudson Bridge in Poughkeepsie the last couple of minutes. I wasn't going to include this bridge in this slideshow, but I felt compelled to include it because it is uh, my friendly neighborhood suspension bridge. It's located about nine miles from my house. Um, I feel very fortunate and very spoiled to have had the opportunity to grow up in the New York City area with all these great world-class bridges. And this is one in the Hudson Valley of New York um, that certainly deserves to be in that conversation and doesn't get the attention it deserves because it's not located in the city itself. Um, but it's not that far of a drive uh, north from the city. In fact, if you started in Midtown Manhattan, you could reach this bridge by train on Metro North. That's not a bad train ride. Um, so this bridge has been here since 1931, I think. And... Um, it's still there, still going. It's one of my favorites, that's for sure. Yeah, it's in, it's in a really neat location. Um, you know, you get some really good scenic views of the Hudson as you're, you're crossing it. And just to the... My mind is blanking. Just to the north of this bridge is the what's called the Walkway Over the Hudson State Park. Yep. Um, that used to be a railroad bridge that burned in the 1970s, and they... Uh, rehabilitated it and opened it as a pedestrian path. Really, really beautiful, spectacular views of the Hudson River and the Mid-Hudson Bridge. And if you want, you can very easily make a loop uh, walk out of it, walk across the Hudson one way over the walkway and walk the other way back over the Mid-Hudson Bridge. Um, I've done that a few times. Definitely worth yeah. it. Yeah. I think they have a run, too. Like I think it's a five-mile loop and then closer to 10 yeah there's there is a run that you can do oh. that involves both bridges <laughs> i know i know erica knows about it oh uh, yes close i haven't actually done it yet but it's close to a 10 mile loop to go across one around through the city and down and back around the other yeah but it's not bad you know it, it's very scenic that whole that whole run it's very cool um well, let's move out to Pittsburgh, where we have a trio of suspension bridges to mention. Um, the Three Sisters bridges on the Allegheny River at downtown Pittsburgh are a trio of I-bar chain suspension bridges. They were actually engineered in the mid-1920s as examples of the first self-anchored suspension bridges in the United States, which is to say that there are no actual anchorages supporting uh, the I-bars, the I-bar cables, or whatever you want to call them. Um, they 
they are anchored by the deck itself rather than being anchored into anchor blocks. Uh, that why they chose I bars as opposed to typical cables? Um, I don't know. I, sometimes they use well. Self anchored spans are used also when there's there's difficulty in the bedrock in the area. They're like embedding something in rock like that. Um, I don't know if that was enough. I don't know if that was an issue with these. Because I, I feel, I get the feeling that when they realized that they had a chance to build three bridges right next to each other, they were like, well, let's just build them all identical to each other. So they may have encountered an issue with one of them and then just decided to mirror the design of the other two off of the third. That's that's the feeling I get when they when I read about them. Uh, Makes sense. If you can design one, why bother designing three? Yeah, they, they were built off of the same basic set of plans. I, I think there are slight modifications to all three of them, if you really want to get technical and look into them specifically. But um, for the purposes of this discussion, they're more or less identical. I, w I would say with a bridge engineer in the room with me that you would have to have three completely different set of plans, mm. even if 95% of the plans are identical, there would be enough tiny difference. Now you certainly would. Now you certainly would. Back then you didn't. Back then the contractors were like confident at just looking at plans that were rough sketches and building off of it. Yeah. Well, we haven't gotten to Tacoma Narrows yet. <laughs> the whole different issue on that bridge. Uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Well, Fun fact about Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh um, is the city in the country that has the most bridges, uh, and I think the most suspension bridges as well. There's just a, a ton of little ones all over the city. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that that would be more than New York City overall. When you look at all the little bridges that New York City has for that matter. Ah, good old Rhode Island. Yeah, I want to talk about the Mount Hope Bridge. It's not, um, it's nothing special as far as its dimensions are concerned, but it has a very. We're we're gonna talk about cautionary tales during tonight's show. Uh, cautionary tales of building on the cheap, because what happens sometimes when you try to cut corners and you try to get too cute with designs, it ends up costing you more in the long run anyway. Uh, case in point would be the Mount Hope Bridge here in Rhode Island. Um, built by the firm of Robinson and Steinman, the engineers were Holton Robinson and David Steinman. We're going to talk about those two names uh, as we go through tonight's show, by the way. So you'll hear them, you'll hear their names brought up uh, multiple times here. Um, this bridge was built in the late 1920s. Uh, there were... There was an original design that was submitted, and then the contractor that was picked felt that they could uh, construct the main cables out of uh, ungalvanized steel wire, as running contrary to the proposed design, which involved galvanized steel wire. Um, I got they tried it. They said, hey, this is going to be cheaper. It's going to save us time. It did save them time, and it was cheaper. However, <laughs> just about a few months before the bridge was scheduled to open, and as they were laying out the roadway, they noticed that strands in the main cables were breaking. And the only real way to address it at that point was to literally disassemble the superstructure and spin new cables and start over again. Um, so that's what they had to do. They had to take down the superstructure. The bridge was declared unsafe, so they had no other option at that point but to take it all apart. They didn't have to replace the towers. They just spun two new cables, this time using the more conventional galvanized steel wire, which is what the design engineer had insisted they use from the, from the get-go. Um, and so they did that, and then they reassembled the superstructure, and... In the end, it cost the contractor an additional million dollars in 1929 money to disassemble oh. and reassemble the bridge. Dang. That's a lot of money. So all that money that they thought they were going to save ended up, they ended up spending it and then some. 
just to try to get this bridge right. But when I, they, I wouldn't at all think this happens nowadays with modern bridges such as those that are cable state crossing wide parts of the Hudson. Well, fortunately for you, this is not a cable state bridge presentation. I don't have to talk about that. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> Um, but this bridge opened in 1929, and ever since that mishap during construction, it has continued to stand the test of time, and it's still with us today. Uh, if you move a little bit down the coast into Newport, Rhode Island, we have this bridge built in the 1960s. Uh, this one stands today. It was built in the late 60s. I think it opened in 69. Um it is New England's longest suspension bridge by main span length, uh, and it holds that title today. Uh, the U.S. Navy had a huge influence on this bridge's design and its location. Originally, the Navy blocked its design and construction. Um, however, after a lot of concessions to the Navy involving the design and appearance of the bridge, uh, the Navy allowed its construction to proceed. Little known fact about this bridge was that it was at one time proposed to be included as part of a toll road turnpike um, that would have connected mainland Rhode Island with Newport and then also southern Massachusetts. Um, that was a relatively short-lived proposal, though, that never really went anywhere. But the things that could have been... Nonetheless, there is the Rhode Island Turnpike and Bridge Authority, which is the owner and operator of this bridge. And as the name suggests, it was the agency was certainly envisioned to operate a lot more than just one toll bridge. Well, they, they did operate another toll bridge not too long ago until they had to reduce the tolls to 10 cents and then eliminate them again. <laughs> well, they, so. they yeah, they put the... This was the um, the bridge on Rhode Island 24, which Sacking is the third river. span that mm. connects to uh, Aquidneck Island, where Newport is. Yep. And they reconstructed that, and they intended to do it as a toll bridge, and they couldn't agree on what the toll rates should be and if there should be tolls. But, but you, since you can't toll an existing bridge, um, they had to put what they called a placeholder toll in place of $0.10. Cents. Uh, just to not lose their right to collect tolls on it, but they they decided not to do that ultimately. Um, so the yeah. uh, Claiborne Pell Bridge, the one we're looking at, that is the only toll bridge uh, in Rhode Island at this point. And uh, M MPW, the road geek, points out that in addition to Pell, they do operate the Mount Hope that we saw, the Sakonet that we're talking about, and the Jamestown Bridge, which is the other side of the uh, the bay from the Pell Bridge. So they, they operate four, the four longest bridges in Rhode Island. They only charge tolls on one of them. I really like the Deer Isle Bridge in Maine myself. Um, this is one of my favorite. Yeah. So this is another yeah. creation of Robinson and Steinman engineers. Uh, built in the late 30s. We're actually somewhat fortunate it's even still with us um it encountered a lot of issues with wind stability um right around the time that it opened and we're going to talk more about instability with winds uh later but um a lot of modifications were made to the original structure if you look at the picture on the left you can kind of see some of the additional uh cabling the additional stays that were added across the deck and then there were additional diagonal stays added longitudinally along the deck. Um, this and other modifications to the superstructure itself have stabilized it over the years. But um, this is a nice little bridge in down east Maine that is pretty far out of the way for regular travelers. But if you, if you have some time on your hands, I definitely recommend you check this one out. Yeah, I agree. Very, very highly recommended. And although it may not seem like a very important bridge, just given the relative lack of traffic and that it's out of the way, it is the only connection from Deer Isle onto the mainland. So to the people that live there in Stonington and some of the other towns, it is a, a critical connection.
Here's a bridge that is right in Mike's wheelhouse, I know. Um, Mike doesn't live too far from Annapolis. Um, we have our first uh, twin span bridge of the evening. So the Bay Bridge exists in two parts. There's a span running eastbound and a span for westbound traffic. The eastbound span is the one that opened first in 1952. The parallel span opened in the 1970s. The only, the only real issue I want to bring up with this bridge is that it is oftentimes cited as among travelers as being one of the quote-unquote most dangerous or scariest bridges for travelers. And I don't know, it's never really seemed that scary to me, but maybe uh, one of you guys can tackle the myth as far as that title is concerned. Certain people are, are scared of long distances over water in general, and some bridges will have services to drive people, such as one that we're going to be covering a bit later, uh, which I'll just call for now the world's greatest bridge, then we'll get there. But there, it, it is a phenomenon that, that some agencies recognize as such. And the, the other piece of this, if you're on the original span, it is a little narrow, but the other span has a reversible lane. And so if you're driving either in the reversible lane or the other way when the reversible lane is in operation, it can feel very crowded for something that's a freeway on both sides. High speeds with very little separation between the lanes. So I think that's where that reputation comes from. If it's in its normal configuration, I think it's a lot less scary. Again, unless unless you really can't cross those distances, in which case, what are you doing? Uh, if, if there's one contributing factor here that's a little unique to these bridges it's relatively low railing heights as you're driving so even as you're approaching the suspension spans you can see all around you as a driver or passenger you can see down into the water a lot of bridges especially suspension bridges will have trusses as you get towards the main span or you'll have at least higher railings to make it more difficult to peer over the side uh, I'm thinking of Delaware Memorial as an example of this. You can, but many many tall bridges have something there. So this this does not, and therefore you can feel like you're. It can feel more dangerous just that you're sort of flying. So part of the issue also is that the bridge is curved. Uh, it has a curve probably about a quarter of the way out uh, from Annapolis, and this is because when they built it. Uh, they were building the original bridge to replace a ferry, and the qualifications were that the bridge had to be, the landings for the bridge had to be in the same places roughly as where the ferry terminals were, because that's where the access roads were. But the main span had to cross the shipping channel at a right angle, because uh, otherwise it would need to be an awful lot longer. So that curve, uh, I think, contributes a little, because you can kind of see what's coming up off to your side. Um, the narrowness of the eastbound span, as Steve mentioned, that's a, that's a contributing factor. Though the eastbound span does have like a Jersey wall style parapet on either side, uh, which is solid. Whereas a good chunk of the westbound span has just a, a see-through railing where you can just look through and, and see out to the water. Um, the reversible lane, it is, uh, you know, normally it operates two lanes eastbound and three westbound, but they reversed the lane, used to be just on Friday and Saturday uh, to help beach traffic get out to the eastern shore, but nowadays there's enough commuter traffic from the eastern shore that they, they will do it uh, every afternoon rush hour, but they will not do it if it's raining or if there are really high winds just because the... Um, the bridges were not designed to support a full, like, concrete zipper wall. So the only thing they can do to separate the directions is a double yellow line, which there have unfortunately been some pretty spectacular accidents there. Oh, I've um, heard, yeah. Yeah. But this is, this is definitely one of my favorite bridges, and also have to say you get good bang for your buck if you have a Maryland Easy Pass because it only costs two fifty for a round trip. <laughs> yeah, well, we could spend all all time tonight just talking about toll rates and stuff like that. I know you're an expert in that stuff. 
Um, um, I'm keeping my mouth shut on purpose. No, okay. And, I, and I'm an expert in getting around the toll race. Yeah. So. <laughs> that you are. Yeah. Um, well, we're speaking of favorite bridges, the, in Portland, Oregon, this is this is up there with me as far as one of my favorites. Um, the St. John's Bridge at the uh, the upper end of the Willamette River in Portland. This is another one of those uh, 1930s um, Gothic art style suspension bridges. Again, a product of the firm of Robinson and Steinman. Uh, it featured the longest suspended span of any type in the state of Oregon until 1973. And it continues to be one of the, if not the signature bridge of the city of Portland. This, I, are you uh, counting the, oh, you're, you're talking about suspension bridges or bridges in general? What? When you say the longest. Longest span, yeah. It Is was it actually long. longer than the Astoria Bridge main span? Well, I'm talking about, sure. um... Well, that opened after 73. No, the Story Bridge I predated 73. I, I was just checking because that one came to mind as a bridge with a long major span also in Oregon. But not well, suspension, I, so we're yeah. not going to be covering it today. Yeah, well, we're not covering it anyway, so... I might have gotten my notes mixed up between Portland and Oregon. Well, that one is 1,233 feet. Yeah. Well, actually, it's even that's not the longest span in Oregon. Yeah. Either. Well, it it does beat this one by twenty six feet. I just checked that. I'm so. glad, Steve. I'm glad you got your calculator out. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to help. There, there. Doug has, and and I I sort of wanted to phone a friend and have Doug talk about this one since it is Oregon, but uh, he he noted that the Fremont Bridge is going to be the. the well, that's the yeah. well, that's the one I was alluding to. Yeah. 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 I think that one still has the longest span in Oregon, of any bridge. So, um, all right. So we got the honorable mentions out of the way. So let's Ew. let's quickly, guys, try to go through the history of the America of America's longest suspension bridges. I've listed out the ones here. It's, it's actually it actually worked out pretty nice because there's ten of them. Um, these are all the bridges that could claim to be the world's longest at one time or another. America's longest. Well, America's or the world's longest. Um, yeah, in all of these cases, yeah. But for the 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 theme of tonight being American suspension bridges, yeah, the history of America's longest, yeah. Um. I got ten of them listed here. Uh, let's let's run through these pretty quick, shall we? And I'm going to start with one in West Virginia that's actually not carrying any vehicle traffic, at least not at the moment. Uh, Ooh. Not nah, so. Ooh. The Wheeling Bridge came about in the late 1840s. It was the world's first suspension bridge with a main span of a thousand feet or longer. Um, there was a pretty noteworthy collapse of this bridge in high winds in 1854. Uh, the, the description of what happened here with the deck is very similar to a bridge that we will talk about in Washington State coming up. The problem is that there were no cameras in 1854, and obviously no video cameras, so... It really was one of those accounts that most people wanted to dismiss as far as historians who were looking back at it. I think it was a little too hard to believe. But now that we have video footage of a bridge behaving similar to how this bridge behaved in 1854, um, we can kind of imagine what happened here. Um, the bridge was ultimately rebuilt and it continues to stand to this day. Uh, since 2019, it has been closed to all vehicle traffic because of repeated um, oversized loads mm -hmm. using this bridge, and they just decided to close it off entirely to vehicle traffic. Um, I think there is significant work that needs to be done to this bridge as far as rehabilitation is concerned before they'll even think about putting cars back on it. So that's kind of where we stand with that. 
very angry. And yeah, and yes, Bob, I, I agree with Bob Malm. Cameras did exist by 1840s. Well, okay, but... <clears throat> if someone could have photographed that collapse if they wanted to, they, probably, they would have had to stand there with a daguerreotype in silver and all that, but they could have done it. And wouldn't have just come as one giant blurry thing? Well, no, after it collapsed, yeah. not, not during. Here's a bridge that never actually did collapse, and it's in Cincinnati. Um, this is... This bridge was... Started in the 1850s, and its construction was held up through a lot of the Civil War. It's actually kind of remarkable that they continue construction on this thing during the Civil War at all. Um, it was interrupted a couple of times uh, due to the threat of potential Confederate invasion of Cincinnati, but that was once that was repelled, they resumed construction in 1863. Um, bridge was open to traffic formally on New Year's Day, 1867. This, I think, when you look at it, it's very much a prototype for the Brooklyn Bridge. And perhaps it's not surprising to anybody that the same chief designer engineer was involved here. And in fact, uh, Roebling's name is on this bridge to this day. So the, the and we'll get to the Brooklyn Bridge, so I don't want to spoil that, but does... It looks like from this view that you have you also have three redundant structure types on this bridge because I'm seeing what looks like cables radiating from the towers that would indicate that it does have cable stay in addition to the suspension bridge and truss. Yeah, I, I don't know how independent the truss is as a support element, but certainly you have the suspension and then you have the cable stay element in there. A really interesting structure, yeah. See, Erica, I included that picture that I took from the Manhattan Bridge of the Brooklyn Bridge. And you can see it on the right in this slide. Um, if you were... Yeah, it looks nice. Yeah, it's not bad, right? <laughs> um, so the best I, photo in the <laughs> As I said, the, the, the Cincinnati Bridge can really be described as a prototype for the Brooklyn Bridge. And maybe now you see what I mean when you look at pictures of the Brooklyn Bridge compared to the one at Cincinnati. Um, this was the crowning achievement of its uh, lead designer, John Rowling, although unfortunately he didn't live to see it completed. Um, his son, Washington, who, by the way, had an interesting career of his own, uh, separate from his father. It's Washington served in the U.S. Uh, Army during the Civil War, and he had some interesting stories himself. I believe he was present at Gettysburg, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but his son Washington finished the bridge. Um, certainly one of the great achievements of the 1800s, up until, I mean, it, it's one of the great achievements in American engineering history period uh, considering the technology they had to work with um, completed in 1883 it is I would say one of if not the quintessential American suspension bridges I think and this... from a historical perspective this this bridge served a really important uh, role as well because it was the first fixed link between the city of Brooklyn and the city of New York, um, obviously before Brooklyn was part of New York City, but Brooklyn would not be what it is today without uh, this bridge spurring development in the late 1800s. I, I would wager, as you guess, that this, this is still the longest bridge that has all of these structure types combined because shortly after the Brooklyn Bridge, they were started getting comfortable enough with suspension bridge designs that they didn't need the multiple factors of safety that they included at the time. So you wouldn't see cable stay plus suspension used at the same time for the reason that they they had more comfort with what factor of safety was provided by cables and especially galvanized cables. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that most of the bridges after 
this one, if they have any kind of cable stay element in it, it was added afterwards. You know, it was not original to the structure, but it was very much a, a part of the original structure here. <clears throat> Well, we talked about modifications to bridges after they were completed, and I, I do want to talk about the Williamsburg uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that its structure was nearly compromised by a fire during construction, although it you know the damage was somewhat limited and they were able to continue. Um, but actually, after opening, they discovered that there were problems with the superstructure sagging under loading from subway trains. So they came in and they added additional piers underneath the side spans or the anchor spans closer to the anchorages. So you see how there are three support piers um, between the main tower and the anchorage. Well, originally, when the bridge opened, there was only one pier. Uh, so they came in and they added two additional piers. They added more structural steel to the superstructure, um, and that seemed to rectify the problem. So actually, the bridge you're looking at right now is not really the bridge that opened in 1903, but it's 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 ugly. Pretty, it's pretty well. I <laughs> can say a lot about this bridge and how much I despise it for its appearance. Um, that's, that said, it would have been the ideal candidate to carry I-78 of the three bridges there, so well, yeah. it, was, it was ready for that role if it was going to take it on. Yeah. Um, on the subject of that, there, was, there were talks about replacing this bridge as early as the 1960s, and it may or may mm -hmm. not have been in parallel with the discussions about I-78 across Manhattan. Um, either way... Right. This bridge was in terrible shape in the 70s and 80s to the point where they considered just closing it and building a new bridge altogether just out of the fact that the bridge was not structurally safe. Um, but it was significantly rehabbed in the 90s and the early 2000s um, over about a 15-year period, which wrapped up in 2003. And... Um, it's still it's still hanging in there. Like the the work that they did, they invested about a billion dollars in nineteen eighties money um, into this bridge over a fifteen year period, and so they they practically replaced the bridge in place. You know, they they did all the structural uh, repairs and upgrades uh, while limiting traffic on the bridge, of course. But in their minds, that was a better investment than just tearing it down and building a new bridge altogether. It would have been an interesting discussion if I-78 was completed because for those who know the Williamsburg Bridge, it splits as you go in either direction into an inner roadway that's inside the the towers and an outer roadway that goes uh, it goes under the, uh, the outer structure of the towers there. Um, both of those roadways, but especially the outer ones, feature extremely narrow lanes. When you have a truck, you are probably not going to be able to pass that truck yeah. the entire length of that inner outer yeah. roadway until they merge back together. So as an interstate, even though right now you nominally have four lanes each way, those there was you never know with New York City, would they have just used this bridge and kept it four lanes each way and just you fend for yourself? Would they have striked the outer roadway as a single lane? Would they have striked both roadways as a single lane? I think that's probably a more modern way that they would approach it. Probably, at least in the 60s, they would have just kept it as is. But the argument for replacing it, if it was going to become I-78, it would have been a stronger case for, we can't fit trucks in these lanes, we have to do something. Yeah. Yeah, I think those lanes were nine feet. So, at, at points, yes, definitely. I mean, yeah, there's no way that you can pass people. At yeah, those, those lanes are incredibly narrow, for sure. Yeah. Which is why I've kind of said over the years that when they had the chance to replace it in the 80s, they should have taken it. Because, yeah, you'll spend more money up front, but you'll end up with a much more functionally useful bridge for the next 100 years than what you got right now. And to the people who say, well, what about the subway? Well, what about the subway? You put it under the river in a tunnel. 
which is, by the way, is what they've talked about doing, not just here at the Williamsburg, but down at the Manhattan Bridge. They've talked about taking the subway tracks off of that for a long time, um, really to save on the wear and tear of the suspension system. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I understand that they wanted to preserve the Williamsburg, but I would have replaced it if it was me. I'm, that would have been my. Decision. I'm gonna. I'm going to now throw the uh, the engineering hat in the ring, and I'll let Erica follow up if she wants. But oh the issue with trains, when you, when you have vehicles on a bridge, even if you're talking a traffic jam, ton of vehicles moving slowly, a lot of trucks, whatever, you're still distributed the load across the span relatively evenly, both, both from end to end and from side to side. Now, obviously, if you're backed up in one direction but not the other, it's a bit of a lopsided load, but at least over the entire deck, you're relatively, the weight's relatively distributed. Every time a train crosses, you have a weight equal to several loaded trucks, but there's no distribution. It's only in one spot on the bridge. Plus, you're talking about the vibrations. At, the rails aren't perfect. The train itself, we're talking New York City, so come on, it's like 30 years old. So you, you've got vibrations from the train. You've got a point load instead of a distributed load moving across the span. If you look at bridges that are custom built only for trains as opposed to for vehicles, you will see they're built much heavier because even though most of the time they're not carrying any load and even though a train overall weighs less than the rest of the vehicles on a normal bridge, that's the reason why because that one point load puts that much more stress on the elements of a bridge. And so that's why you're that much better off moving trains off of a bridge when you have the opportunity. Yeah, and you also get a lot of really weird forces on train bridges from pumping and rocking and even traction and braking from the train speeding up and slowing down really causes some interesting loads that I would hate to try to design that on a suspension system. It's bad enough on a standard highway-style bridge trying to take all that down through the piers. Yeah, and, and when a subway line is running, uh, even at max capacity, the trains are usually spread about two minutes apart. So, I mean, just because they take so much time to start and stop, you need to have some significant space between them. So it's very unlike traffic, and that traffic, if the traffic is heavy, at least it's fairly continuous, um, as opposed to the train, which is, you know, for... 15 seconds out of every two minutes is like a huge weight and then nothing. So I, I don't envy you bridge engineers, uh, Erica, no. for having to <laughs> be able to come up with a design for something like that. That is major league engineering, that's for sure. It's amazing. By the way, they, they did all these designs in the 1800s without the benefit of computers or any of that stuff. All that all that stuff had to be hand-drawn and hand-calculated and all that stuff. So, Just why a lot of these older bridges have a lot of extra conservatism in places because they weren't able to get as exact. They just said, eh, close enough, go with it. Yeah. So they'll round up to the conservative side yep. of that situation, mm -hmm. yeah. They did that until approximately 1939, as we as we'll find out soon. <laughs> well, actually, I don't know about that, but we'll we'll talk about that coming yeah, up. The, um, the pair of bridges I'm thinking of were both late 1930s designs. So that's that's when they gave up on the era of conservatism. Well, in some ways, you're right. Yeah, um, this bridge was not from the 1930s. It was from the it was from a little bit before that. Um, Another one of my friendly neighborhood suspension bridges, the Bear Mountain Bridge opened in 1924, surpassing the length of the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, really built in a nice scenic area. Um, it's a very picturesque location here in the lower Hudson Valley. And I know that um, you guys would probably agree with that. It's my favorite Hudson River crossing. Is it? Yep. <laughs> I may have to agree. Bear Mountain's one of my favorite bridges. Yeah, it's a beautiful span. It's a beautiful location, and from Steve's perspective, it's the southernmost crossing that only costs a buck forty-five to go. <laughs> oh, that's why it's his favorite. I, I see. No, it, okay. it, it, the setting of it is is wonderful, and getting there, you go through such scenery on both sides. It's just a very 
relaxing, beautiful drive to to use this bridge. And also another fun fact about this bridge, if you look really carefully at the photo on the left, you can actually see an additional set of cables underneath one of your main sets of cables. They actually have separate cables just to monitor. They don't actually hold any load, but they put those in at some point. Uh, you should talk into the microphone so I can hear you. Oh, oh sorry. So if you look at the picture on the left, there's actually an additional set of cables underneath your main cables on one side, and they actually added those just to monitor the bridge, not actually carry load. Oh, is that what, is that what that's for? Yeah, they're just monitoring cables to, I'm not exactly sure what they're monitoring, but yeah, that's what those are for. Be like uh, vibration or like load transfer stuff, maybe. I'm not sure. NSA COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, the bridge has to quarantine the next two weeks. Sorry, guys. Nobody's allowed across. <laughs> um. So two years after the Bear Mountain Bridge opened, uh, this bridge opened down in Philadelphia, taking the claim of world's longest. It was originally known as the Delaware River Bridge when it was built. It wasn't renamed for Benjamin Franklin until the 1950s. And the reason why it was actually renamed was because they didn't want to confuse this bridge with another suspension bridge that they were building a few miles to the south, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So they decided to name this bridge for Benjamin Franklin to avoid any potential confusion between the two suspension bridges. Um, I would like to say that you know, I said earlier that the Manhattan Bridge in New York City was one of my favorite uh, bridges in all of New York City. It was my favorite of that cluster of Lower East River suspension bridges. This bridge to me looks a lot like the Manhattan Bridge of Philadelphia. Uh, it's got a very similar paint scheme. Um, it's also similar in the fact that it carries subway tracks on the outside of the uh, roadway, similar to how the Manhattan Bridge is configured. Um, it's also got a similar paint color. It's another really nice looking bridge, and um, we're very fortunate to still have it with us after over 90 years now. It opened in 1926, so that's 95 years ago when it opened. Actually, I, I just lied in chat. You're on the air, Steve, talking to the microphone. I just lied in chat. I said, Data Jang uh, asked what the purpose of what we call the GW Bridge as well. You also have them on the Benjamin Franklin and many major spans in the area. So this is a fine time to answer the question as fine as any. Uh, in the 80s, in the 90s, well, I'll, I'll, let you, with, I'll let you answer the question, Steve, but you got to talk into the microphone. I am. I don't know where my microphone is on this damn computer. Leave me alone. Well, I heard you. <laughs> well, I heard you a lot better just now. Okay, I, I will just be angry then. Okay. But um, in terms of why tolls are one way, it's because in the eighties and nineties, toll agencies were finding significant backups at their toll plazas, ever growing, and the easiest way to deal with that was to make the toll one way, so you could only demolish four or five toll booths on one side. As, as let's say there were 12 or 14 in each direction you do that now suddenly you've got 20 plus in one direction so now you've got a lot more capacity the other way is free flowing so that's not going to bottleneck um and that works for bridges that worked for the garden state parkway it really unbottled the essex county section there so that's that's the reason any agency would go to one-way tolling it's it's for capacity purposes so with the advent now of open road tolling, we're seeing discussions by various agencies, in, at least internally, do they want to go back to two-way tolling because now it's no constraint on traffic. The downside of one-way tolling is in certain locations, if you have free bridges further up the river, you'll see people use the free bridge to go the direction that the other one's tolled, but then they'll come back on the toll bridge because that was their bridge of choice. So. If I'm going to Delaware, let's say, I will cross up at Washington's Crossing. I used to cross at Scudder's Falls. I could also cross the Trenton Makes Bridge, but there are a number of free bridges for me to get into Pennsylvania. 
and then go down to Delaware for free. Coming back, I would then use any one of the to one-way told spans because that's my opportunity to drive it for free. I am not the only person who thinks this way, which may surprise you, but the, that's the argument for going back to two-way tolls is that it balances traffic again. So, yeah, so Boston, uh, they recently went back to two-way tolls at their harbor crossings. Um, and one other interesting thing I'll point out is uh, a common theme with both the Port Authority crossings going into New York, uh, the crossings going into Philly, the crossings going into San Francisco. When they decided to make the tolls one way, they almost always make the tolls one way going into the city. And, and that's a good that's point probably, to bring up, Mike, yeah. Yeah, that, that's most likely because at the time, manual toll collection served as a way to meter the traffic uh, that got dumped onto the city streets, whereas yep. in the other direction, leaving the city, you wanted to get the cars out of the city as quickly as possible. Yeah, you didn't want the backup in the city itself, yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's one of the, by the way, that's one of the concerns I have about going cashless at the Hudson River crossings in the city, because you're removing that metering effect. So what are they going to do to compensate for that? But we'll talk about that again in a little bit here. Uh, remind me to, when we get to the GWB, remind me to bring that up again. Um, yeah, it, 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 New York in particular has that. Uh, Philly, theoretically, there are delays getting into Philly, but it's a, it's a New York special that dealing yeah. with those. In New, York, uh, routinely, in, in New York, the problem is going to be acute. So, Yeah. 40-minute delays at toll plazas is pretty normal for a weekday in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mike, here's your Ambassador Bridge. Uh, would you like to Would you like to talk about the Ambassador Bridge again, or are you good? So you'll notice that the, uh, the spans on either end don't have the vertical cables, uh, as I pointed out earlier. Um, this may be, I believe this is the longest international suspension bridge uh, in the world that connects to two different countries. Um, connects uh, Detroit, Michigan in the USA to the north and Windsor, Ontario, Canada to the south, which, yes, Windsor is south of Detroit. Um, this bridge is privately owned, which is, is very unique. Uh, Maddie, Maddie Maroon, uh, he is the oh. man who built the bridge and he is... <laughs> Not very well liked uh, to the point where the governments of uh, Michigan and Ontario decided they were going to build a, another parallel bridge to the south, uh, basically Yay. undermining uh, this uh, man's monopoly on crossing the uh, strait there, uh, the Detroit River between Canada and the USA. I've actually never driven over this, but from what uh, all the pictures I've seen, it looks Looks like a pretty impressive bridge, so I'm hoping to uh, drive over it before they possibly tear it down. Um, yeah, yeah. These, these pictures were taken in uh, 2020, last year. And at the time, the border was closed to non-essential traffic. But there's a hell of a lot of truck traffic still that's got to get across uh, in one direction or the other. And as you can see in the pictures here, this bridge sure handles a lot of commercial traffic. I think it handles close to 20% of all of the volume of trade across the border between the U.S. and Canada. Which is, I, I believe, the busiest uh, truck crossing between the U.S. and Canada. Well, easily, it's easily that, but I think if you add up the amount of trade that goes across this bridge annually... Um, it's by far the busiest crossing of any border crossing between the U.S. and Canada. And there's a lot of them, as we know. Yeah. I, w I was looking up to try to confirm that the Ambassador is the longest international span, uh, at least suspension span, it appears that is the case. Interesting fact, if Wikipedia is correct, and we all know about grains of salt there, since the Ambassador Bridge was built, the longest bridge span in the world has always been a suspension bridge. Hmm. Um, yeah, okay. I, I don't know, but that's what they say, so. Well, certainly from a certain point in time, right? So... Well, they're, no, they're saying at, since, since the Ambassador Bridge, any world's longest bridge has been a suspension bridge. Oh, yeah, well, that's definitely true, yeah. That's an, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, note there 
There are other bridge styles that, in theory, could could yield equally long spans, but they just haven't. Theoretically, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Then it comes in. Then cost comes into play and all that stuff. I mean, you could theoretically build a mile long arch bridge if you wanted to, but. Are we ever going to see that? No, because it would be Erica, incredibly Erica. expensive yeah. to do so. So it's just a lot cheaper to build a suspension bridge that's a mile long instead of an arch bridge or a cable stay bridge of that length. Um, you guys want to take a five minute voice break at this juncture or keep going? What do you want to do? I, I'm happy to talk smack about you five minutes while being very distant from the microphone all right well why don't we do that um let's take a five minute voice break here it's 7 11 on the east coast we'll come back at, well, we'll come back at 7 15 while we're on our little break here you can look at the top 10 america's suspension bridges uh that we'll be going into in depth when we come back don't miss it Erica, is Steve talking about me right now, or what? What's going on? Or did they turn their mics off? That's what's going on. Yeah, they probably muted their mics so that they could swear at me uh, off camera. I can't believe... I, oh, I've hey, been Steve, what's going on? Erica mentioned to me that there's a 21 Counties of New Jersey song, and I'm trying to find the right one. Oh, so you, so you found that there's multiple of these? There are apparently multiple. Well, I don't know. He just clicked on one, and I don't know what those people were doing. See, I knew there was some reason we had to have Erica on the show tonight. <laughs> Are, are we are we muted on YouTube or are we live on YouTube now? No, I, did, I can hear you loud and clear, and I'm sure the nice people on YouTube can hear you right. also. Let's see what happens if I play this, if they can hear this. <laughs> yeah, I can't hear Jack. Are you trying to play something? I have no idea what's going on right now, people. I'm sorry. <laughs> we learned a different one in school. We did not learn this in school. We did. And it actually has like a tune to it. I found wow. it. I just... I don't remember quite enough because I don't think I actually sang. This this is like when the Animaniacs would do the states and intentionally forget one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or like the countries of the world or something like that. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And they'd like leave out like Zimbabwe or something. Because <laughs> nobody knows where the hell Zimbabwe is anyway. Southern Africa. I know exactly where Zimbabwe is. I could, you know what? I could probably tell you where Zimbabwe is. I take that back. So while we've been on our short break here, um, Redneck Lover has dropped us a super chat, so thank you very much for that. He says... Uh, eating Panda Express on the Illinois Tollway. Well, thank you, mate. Um, I'd be curious to know which oasis on the Illinois Tollway system has a Panda Express. I'm not familiar with that. So let me know exactly which one that is, and I'll keep it in mind the next time I'm out in Illinois. I think it's the Bamboo Oasis. <laughs> it's not the one that they just tore down to build the uh, O'Hare Western Bypass, right? That wouldn't be possible. I 490? Uh-huh. Okay, so we're back. 
The slide you've been looking at the few the last few minutes features the 10 longest suspension bridges in the United States by main span length. And let's go through all 10 of them. Guys, um, yeah. is there anything about this list that you find interesting before we take off? I didn't know Carquinez Bridge was renamed. That's it. That's all I got. I always love that Verrazano Mara is actually the longest that everyone always tries to tell me what the gate is, but they're all wrong. You know, Steve and Erica are still having difficulty talking into the microphone. Yes, because we don't know where it is. So <laughs> leave us alone. Accept accept our faraway voices. Hey, Erica started to say something about the Verrazano Bridge, and then I couldn't hear it because it just sounded like a boo 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 boo. <laughs> but I always find it funny because Verrazano Narrows is the longest, and people always try to say Golden Gate is longer, but they are all wrong. They absolutely are wrong. That's right. By 60 feet, too. And not by much, yeah. I, I wanted to point out, while we're looking at this list, that three of the top ten entries on this list are from the city of New York. And another three of the ten are from, if not San Francisco, then the greater San Francisco Bay region of California. That's it. That's all I got. Really, another two, you could say, are from the Philadelphia <laughs> metro region. Um, and then you've got the random ones in Michigan and Washington. But um, it's interesting how well represented New York City and San Francisco are uh, in this list. So it's not natural. too surprising. I mean, they're... Big, great cities, large population centers, uh, s separated by bodies of water. Bodies of water that can only really be crossed with large bridges. Right, exactly. Yep. Got to keep those shipping channels open. That's right. Or tunnels. Um, number 10 on our countdown. Let's count down from 10 to 1. Let's start in South Philadelphia. I mentioned that the Benjamin Franklin Bridge received its current name to avoid confusion with another suspension bridge. Well, this is that other suspension bridge. Uh, the Wall Whitman built in the late 1950s. Really, your, or your, your standard expressway, early interstate highway era suspension bridge um, carrying I-76, the east end of the Schuylkill Expressway, over into New Jersey. Um, the really interesting part of this bridge from... A planning standpoint is that this crossing of the Delaware River began life as a tunnel, um, which would have crossed the Delaware a little bit further south of where the bridge is located today. Uh, road enthusiasts may know this tunnel as New Jersey Route 44T. Uh, the tunnel idea was proposed briefly, I think, in the 1930s. Steve will correct me if I'm wrong on this, and it was canceled because of the Second World War. And by the time the uh, the war was over and the post-war expressway era was underway, the decision was made to instead build a bridge. That was planned from roughly Paulsboro to Essington. Yeah. That's about all I've got. It, it was added to the books in 1938. I don't have a death date for it, but uh, I do have a link on my site that goes to Steve Anderson's unbuilt stuff on um, Philly roads. So I guess when he talks about the 42 freeway, he he mentions that tunnel. Hmm. So not to diss on this bridge, but this is just so plain. It is probably one of my least favorite suspension bridges. It just does. for that, I like it. Yeah, it, you know, it's, as I said, it's a very um, early interstate highway era bridge. So this is a very standard looking structure that, you know, when they were building the expressways of the 50s and 60s, they resorted to very simple designs like this. Um, and this is just another example. Um Functionally, it works just fine. It it doesn't. It may not be the prettiest looking bridge, but um, it does its job. That's for sure. 
it's sleek and modern. I definitely appreciate it. The, you you don't actually see many bridges that look like this just because most suspension bridges look more ornate. This is a very streamlined design, so yeah, we can appreciate it. Oh yeah, I forgot. This is the part of the slideshow where I have additional slides for each bridge. So while you're looking at these additional pictures, I'll tell you, uh, Walt Whitman was an American author and poet who lived out his final years over in Camden, New Jersey. And the bridge was named in his honor due to the proximity um, of its namesake's residence. Leaves um, of grass, my ass. <laughs> The thing he also has a service area on the New Jersey Turnpike southbound between exits four and three. Yeah, he does. Yeah. The other interesting thing about Whitman is that he was a, um, he was, I guess, the equivalent nowadays of a healthcare worker during the Civil War. He volunteered at uh, Army hospitals down in Washington uh, for a lot of the Civil War. So that's an interesting story if you're interested in looking into that a little bit more. That is a wonderful view. Is that a drone view or is that from a building? That is a drone view, young man. Very, very nice old man. Mm -hmm. That's from the Jersey side, I'm assuming? Yeah, that's in Jersey. Very nice view with Center City there in the background. Um, well, on the subject of plain-looking suspension bridges, it, if Walt Whitman was a plain one, we have, I suppose what you could say is two plain ones side-by-side side that make up this twin-span crossing of the Delaware River down, at, down by uh, Wilmington. Now, the Delaware Memorial Bridge, built and conceived in the late 40s, uh, as a connection between the New Jersey Turnpike and the states of Delaware and Maryland. Uh, the first span opened in 1951. Within a few years of the span's opening, they realized that they had a huge traffic problem on their hands, and so they quickly began design of a parallel span, which opened to traffic in 1968. Um, it can really, these two bridges can really be described as fraternal twins. Um, when they went to design the second span, they utilized the same prototype or the same base model for the design of the second bridge that they used for the first bridge. However, in the 15 years, the 15 to 20 years um, following the completion of the first bridge, construction methods had changed and material uh, delivery had changed. So really what you have here is two different ways to build the same bridge. And that shows in the way that the two of them were built and engineered. There are subtle differences between the two spans. They are not identical twins by any stretch. Uh, even though from a distance you look at them and you just would assume that they're the same. Um, that is actually not the case. So... Again, that's something for you to dive into more on your own if you're interested. But I will, you know, give you that little hint that there are some subtle differences between this between these two bridges that when you add them up, you find that the two of them are actually quite different. They just happen to look well, just about the same. Well, I'll point out one of them. One of them is the, the catwalk, uh, which is, you know, it's not a pedestrian sidewalk. It's not open to the public, but on the... Eastbound span, which is the older of the two, it is an open grate. And on the westbound span, the newer one, it, it's a solid walkway. And another one that I'll bring up is that the original bridge was primarily put together with rivets and steel. Whereas on the second bridge, you see a lot of bolting and welding. So... Oh. From a connection standpoint, and this of course has ramifications throughout the structure as far as the structure's weight and therefore the design of the superstructure as a whole, um, you find that the second bridge is a heck of a lot more different than the initial bridge. Just that jump in time of about 15 years enabled technology to evolve to such a point that the second bridge was built under completely different conditions than the first bridge. 
um, which again has its has its impacts on the overall structure. Um, I would like to mention real quick while we're on the subject of this bridge, there is a public uh, war memorial in Newcastle, Delaware that is tied to this bridge. Of course, the bridge's name is Delaware Memorial Bridge. It was dedicated to honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice in the Second World War from the states of Delaware and New Jersey. Um, the, more, the memorial was expanded to uh, include folks from those two states who perished in the Korean War later. Um, that memorial is open in Newcastle, Delaware. You can go there and see it today. Um, it's definitely worth a visit. If, it, if that's the kind of thing that you're interested in. It gets the Roadway Whiz seal of approval. I really like this picture that we're on right now. Um, this is a picture that I've always wanted to get with my own camera, but I've never... I obviously did not have the technological means to do so until fairly recently but this is a pretty good uh summary shot of these two bridges side by side and again i'm not going to you know nitpick these two bridges to death but if you were to look at these two bridges side by side in this picture you will notice some significant differences between the two of them Structurally, even though on first glance they look very much the same, they are actually quite different. I'm deferring to my structural engineer on what looks different because I don't see anything at this scale that looks different. Well, the, the, you can do that as long as she talks into the microphone. Yeah, but I don't see any differences in this picture either. That's okay. Well, you can look <laughs> at it for the next two weeks if you want and then get back to me. Okay, sounds like a plan. <laughs> So that's the Delaware Memorial. Number eight on our list. We're in New York City for the first time in this list. Uh, the Bronx Whitestone Bridge, built in the late 1930s, built to connect the eastern outer boroughs of New York City, the Bronx and Queens. Uh, construction of this bridge was begun in the mid to late 30s. It was expedited uh, in order to be complete in time for the 1939 World's Fair, which was being held over in Flushing Meadows in uh, northern Queens nearby. Um, Steve, I think this is one of your uh, instability specials, I think, right? Is. Isn't this one that you want to bring up? I think we're going to talk more later when we get to the real special, but for this one... Microphone, Steve. I'm trying. As we talk about the structural modifications for this, I think we'll. I, I, should I give up? I, I don't know where. I, no, I, I can hear you now. I can hear you just fine right now. I, whatever oh. you're doing, when when we can hear you just fine, just do that. You know, it's almost no difference. Um, <laughs> but I, I think we'll we'll talk more about this for the other one and I think for this one just talking about the structural modifications will give you an idea but basically when the other one fell they realized that this had the same problems and said oh crap we'd better fix it and then they, a few years ago they came back and said wait we didn't need to fix it as much as we did let's try to restore some of its original beauty well, part of what they did is they put in a new deck uh, recently. I know the, the deck was under construction when you had your big uh, New York City meet back in 2014, I think. Um, but the deck that they used was more, uh, it was a little bit more rigid, I think. And, and the deck itself added a little bit of structural stability um, it, to compensate for the stiffening truss they put on the side in the uh Early in its life, they I, they removed that. Then I want to say orthotropic here, and I don't know if that is the case, but that would potentially explain it. I think that that, that word right, yeah. sounds familiar, but I, I don't want to commit to that being the correct answer. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, 
So in the aftermath of the Tacoma Narrows collapse, they added a, um, a, a, a stiffening truss above the roadway. They also added these diagonal cable stays, which you can see in this picture, um, to improve the bridge's stability. And then when they replaced the deck later, they realized after kind of having the advantage of computer modeling at their disposal, they realized that they could do away with the stiffened truss that they would, that they added in the 40s. And um, they added these, um, these wedge-like fairings to the edge of the deck to help direct the wind around the structure. Um, so they more or less reinstated the original appearance of the deck. Um, it, and, and I'm glad they did that because this bridge looks a whole lot less clunky than it did in the 90s. When I, when I first crossed this bridge, I thought it looked, you know, as a kid, I thought this bridge looked hideous with the trusses above the roadway. But I'm, I'm glad that they yeah. did away with that stuff. The whole point of this and the one we will get to soon was to look modern, sleek, aerodynamic as light as possible. But while, while you still have these casings on the bottom of the um, the cables, the support cables, so it's not, it still has a little more heft than you'd like. The, with the with the truck there, it just, it, it felt thick. It did not have that aesthetic that they, they wanted. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say the Whitestone Bridge holds a very uh, special place in my family's history because my Grandfather's family was originally from the Bronx, and had this bridge not be built, uh, not been built, they probably would have moved to Westchester instead of uh, Queens. I'm looking to leave the Bronx. Somebody got married not too long ago, also, and I seem to remember some pictures from this particular angle. Uh, well, that someone was is a road geek whose wife is from uh, Whitestone College Point area. Yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. You know. And may and may or may not be contributing to the chat. But maybe, maybe not. I, I oh. may or may not have been, or multiple members of his wedding party may or may not be uh, participating in this chat as well. <laughs> I, there were a lot of pictures from this general area that were flying around at one point. Yeah. Well, from New York, we jump across the country to San Francisco and the Bay Bridge out in San Francisco. And this is a really impressive structure. Um, we teased this at the opening, bridges with multiple main spans. Um, well, here's one of them. Uh, really, you get two bridges for the price of one with this one. Um you have back-to-back -back suspension bridges. So basically you have you have a suspension bridge, you have a central anchorage, and then you have another suspension bridge added on to the end. So you're basically crossing two bridges in one. Um, and that's really just the western half of San Francisco Bay. And then the eastern half does its own thing that we'll make mention of here shortly. But this is just an incredible achievement, engineering-wise. To do all of this is one thing but to do all of this in earthquake country that's something else entirely and what they've achieved here with the construction of the bay bridge in the 1930s is nothing short of remarkable um i don't know and maybe we want to bat this around for a minute but you know people like to talk about this big orange bridge in san francisco as the greatest achievement in San Francisco's bridge history, I would actually argue that it's this one. That's the more impressive achievement. When you take into consideration the overall length of the project, the overall complexity of it, um, and the fact that it all had to be done in the conditions that it was done, um, I think that the Bay Bridge represents the greater engineering achievement and not the Golden Gate, at least in terms of San Francisco. Maybe that's a controversial take. Maybe it isn't, but uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, first of all, both the Bay and the Golden Gate Bridges, they survived all the modern-day earthquakes and earthquake testing and all that. It was the non-suspension eastern span of the Oakland Bay Bridge that had to be replaced for earthquake reasons. Um, 
But I mean, I think they're they're both very impressive um, achievements in their own right, uh, just for very different reasons. Um, this uh, the Oakland Bay Bridge crosses uh, a fairly long but fairly uh, shallow and, and calm section of San Francisco Bay as opposed to the Golden Gate. Um, but just the length and the, the fact that you have two suspension bridges back to back, that's a pretty impressive achievement. Um, and here's a question I actually have. Uh, I know panel members usually aren't supposed to ask other panel members questions, but uh, Erica... The, I've always wondered that central anchorage for this bridge, like, is it possible to create a suspension bridge that just has four towers and has the cables just draped over all four without the central anchorage, or is that, like, a structural impossibility? I am just going to mention that my engineering has not, I've never done suspension bridges. I know very little about engineering them. I feel like it would be possible as long as your spans are all well balanced and similar lengths and similar everything. You're you're dealing with much further cable. Uh, I I actually thought a multi-span bridge. Not you're going to have to start over down. and talk into the microphone, Steve. No, <laughs> but. I, I, this is, because when you're driving it, you don't see that you're driving over an anchorage, so it feels like it's all the same cable. I think it makes more sense that the fact that it's two separate ones, that it, I, the forces that it would have to transmit seems, it, I, I, it's not the same problem to solve as it is in a normal suspension bridge, so I don't know if it's solvable. Anything well, I, is solvable if you give enough time and money. Well, I would I would like to add that if this bridge was built nowadays, they probably could just build one huge suspension bridge, you know, rather than split it up into two separate bridges, right? But now we yeah, have the ability to build mile-long suspended spans rather than the spans that we have here. Um, so if they, if they were to build the Bay Bridge over again and build it today, then... You know, they they probably would have a mile long suspended span in the middle. They so you wouldn't need to have four spans, you know, back to back. Well, uh, you say that, but the the distance from the first tower to the last tower is one and a third mile. So each one is roughly two third. I, I don't know, one and a third divided by three. I, I don't know, some ninth, whatever. But <laughs> the point is. If you if they chose to have all of these spans be suspended, they didn't. They don't have approaches over water like most long span bridges do. They wanted every span suspended, so they might you might actually still need three towers and not just two towers to do this. So it, for all we know, there's still the possibility of this being some sort of unusual, unique bridge, even if they did it with a longer main span. But that's that's fictional roads. Yeah, well, that's for the fictional highways part of the AE Roads Forum. I would like to say that internationally there are examples of three tower suspension bridges. Um, so you could have that, but again, it goes back to what Erica said about structural balance and stability. Um, I'm sure all of that has to be taken into account when you're designing something like that. The last thing I'll point out about this bridge is that it, it's really, uh, I really appreciate whoever uh, made the decision when they, uh, I believe at one time there were trolley tracks on one level and two directions of highway traffic on the other level. Yeah, and they were, moved it yeah. so that westbound uses the upper level and eastbound uses the lower level. And whomever made that decision, I, I got to gotta say i really appreciate the the way they made that decision because you definitely get a far better view from the upper level heading into the city that's just uh absolutely it's just amazing if they did the lower level into the city that would be like a big boo yeah yeah right it is a it is a really grand entrance into san francisco i have to say well we talked about the western segment of the Bay Bridge. Can we just take a second here, a little bonus honorable mention for the replacement East Bay 
self-anchored suspension span, which was completed in 2013. Um, this replaced the original East Bay span, which was a pretty hefty cantilever bridge. Uh, which was, however, compromised compromised rather by the uh, the nineteen eighty nine earthquake. Um, they felt that they just had to start over again with that section of the Bay Bridge, so they built this, and it opened in twenty thirteen, and it it's really interesting to look at, and it's a pretty unique design. I, I don't think there's any other self-anchored suspension bridges that have a single tower that are asymmetrical like this one is but um i don't know do you guys have anything to say about this one i don't like it it makes me uncomfortable <laughs> it it does look kind of weird doesn't it i i just from looking uh, until you look at it closely it seems more like the cable state span than the suspension span yeah, it's definitely got the main cables that go up and over the towers, and it's definitely got the suspender cables that you would find on a traditional suspension bridge. But I, I think that the the single pylon there in the middle, yep, and you know the fact that it's just a single tower that there isn't a second adjoining tower. They actually yep. looked into cable state variations for this span, and they looked into a very primitive skyway quote-unquote proposal uh without a signature span at all um Boom. and actually by the way that was what they were going to go with originally and the reason why this project got held up for so many years was because there was a dispute uh between the uh, designers in the city of oakland over what exactly the this bridge was going to look like the city of oakland saw the skyway proposal and they were like well, wait a second we want something a bit more artsy for our half of the bay so they settled on this but that cost them several years in the design phase that is a true story by the way so anyway it, it it's 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 neat to drive through because it, it's a it's a unique experience for sure but um you know you don't see many bridges that look like this that's for sure So that's my bonus honorable mention for you guys. Well, we're going to stay right in the Bay Area for the next one on the list, number six. Um, the original twin spans of the Carquinez Bridge north of San Francisco um, were built in the 1920s and the 50s. And the original 1920s bridge was due for replacement around the 1990s or so. And instead of replacing both bridges, they decided to replace the elder of the two bridges. And they replaced the original cantilever bridge with this. This is the newest long span suspension bridge to be built in the United States. It was built in 2003. And really since the opening of the second Chesapeake Bay bridge in 1973, we really haven't built that many suspension bridges in America. Um, this being one of the exceptions, this is one of the only ones that we've built. We'll talk about another one that we've built recently in a few minutes, but, um, yeah, this this one kind of stands alone, along with its predecessor, along with its companion further north, um, as one of the only major suspension bridges to be built since the 1970s here in the United States. Um, it's really known as San Francisco's other suspension bridge. It it kind of stands on its own, off to the side. You know, all the attention gets you know thrown on the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge, but <laughs> this one. Uh, kind of stands out of the way but it, it is still there and it's it's worth it's worth some attention i think this bridge is named in honor of iron worker al zampa who was a noteworthy bay area iron worker and a member of what they called the halfway to hell club so what that was was when he was employed at the golden gate bridge in the 1930s he was one of the people who actually fell off the bridge and whose life was saved by the innovative safety net system that was draped underneath the superstructure uh, during its construction. 
And so the people who were saved by the safety net became known as the Halfway to Hell Club. And Zampa, uh, his life was saved by that. And I think there were at least a couple dozen people whose lives were saved by that netting. Um, which, I, as I said, was innovative at the time. And had it not been there, then those people would have perished, no doubt. Um, but uh, he was a very noteworthy iron worker. He, he worked in the Bay Area for, I think, 45 years. He retired at the age of 65. And uh, this bridge is named in his honor. Uh, notice, you might notice that the main cables of this bridge are painted in the same orange color that the Golden Gate Bridge is painted in. Uh, it's a nice little gesture towards his uh, work on the Golden Gate Bridge during its construction. And notice, and one other thing I'd like to add is that the Al Zampa name only applies to the suspension bridge. It does not apply to the Carquinas cantilever bridge that remains standing. So there's a little bit of a, a name difference between the two bridges. But um, the three-span cantilever bridge that carries uh, eastbound Interstate 80 across the strait retains the Carquinas name. The westbound I-80 suspension bridge is the bridge that is named uh, for Al Zampa. Just no noting the bridges here in the Bay Area, it seems like they settled on suspension being one of the best types to build in an earthquake-prone area. Either that or just plain girder bridge with no superstructure, but they haven't really done cable stay. They haven't done trust. They're going suspension for all these spans over there. Yeah, and they're replacing cantilever bridges with suspension bridges, which is interesting. Um, so clearly they've figured out a formula as far as that's concerned. And, and I suppose part of it also is that these cantilever bridges were, you know, getting towards the end of their service lives anyway. I mean, the, the original Carquinez bridge goes back to the 1920s. So, um, it's, it's life was coming to an end anyway, I suspect. Um, interesting though, you're, you're correct in noting that, that they are favoring suspension bridges in these scenarios and not these heavy, uh, steel bridges anymore. All right. We've arrived at the most fun part of tonight's presentation. Washington? Um, yep. <laughs> I think this is one that Steve has been referencing, alluding to for the last hour and a half at least. Um, Steve, do you want to, what do you want to say about the 1940 bridge? Because I actually have some things I'd like to say, but why don't you go first? All I'd like to say is, is my microphone doing better now? I hear you. Yes. I hear you pretty well right now. I turned off noise cancellation. I figured out the problem. Okay. Uh, well, that's all I have to say. Go ahead. That's it, really? I, I, you, I'm not a bridge engineer. I, the bridge engineer is sitting next to me. so I, This bridge is in every single ethics class I've ever taken. Uh, yeah. The, I don't think you go through a physics class or a structural engineering class in college without seeing video of the collapse of this bridge. And it's really miraculous that we even have video of it at all. Because the guy who shot the video of the collapse, which I'm sure you guys have all seen online, he wasn't even supposed to be in the area that day. Um, and he just so happened to have his video camera with him, and so he set it up on the Tacoma shoreline and started shooting. And without that video, I think that the 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 written description of what happened to this bridge would not be believed by people. Because when you look at the video, it, it it's otherworldly, really. I mean, there is just no other example of a bridge behaving that way. At least that we have evidence of, you know. Um, and it's just really, it, it just, even today, it just blows the mind 
to see that a bridge can actually do that in a windstorm. And this was and not this is not a small bridge. You know, we're at number five on our countdown. This is a bridge that had a main span of a half a mile long. So this was not a small bridge by any stretch. Um yeah, I believe when it problem. opened in 1937, in 1940, it was the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Um, so this was a pretty big bridge by the standards of the day. And yet it was just torn to pieces by this windstorm. And it, the, the video is still incredible. It is remarkable. It is haunting for an engineer to watch, even today. So anyway, a little bit of the backstory of the original bridge. There was talk about building a bridge between Tacoma and the Kitsap Peninsula going back to the 19 you know the early 1920s. And the original design, see we talked about cutting corners with the Mount Hope Bridge, remember? Well, I'm going to give you another cautionary tale here with this bridge because the original design that was submitted for this bridge in the late 1930s featured a much wider superstructure and it featured, you know, stiffened trusses underneath the roadway for additional dead weight and support in, you know, windy conditions. Um, the original design was passed over in favor of the design that you're looking at on the slides here. Um, the engineers who came in with this design said, well, we can build this same bridge for half the price. In effect, that's what they were saying. So they built a much lighter bridge. Um, and they knew they were in trouble almost immediately with this thing because as soon as they completed the roadway, even construction workers in the summer of 1940 were reporting that the bridge would move even in light breezes it would sway and it would oscillate up and down and there was just something that they that right away they could tell something was not right um, there were studies done in the fall of 1940 there was actually a pretty significant study issued in early November of 1940 complete with recommendations about what to do about the instability in the bridge. Um, none of the solutions that were suggested were ever implemented because five days after the study was issued or study was released, the bridge collapsed in the pictures that you're seeing here. Um, what they probably would have done if they had been able to try anything was they probably would have given it the Bronx Whitestone treatment they would have added additional steel to stiffen it. They would have added diagonal stays in the deck, similar to what they did at the Whitestone and at the Deer Isle bridges. They would have at least tried that first to see if that worked. Um, but as I said, they never got to try it. Uh, this bridge just had serious aerodynamic problems from day one. It, it's really interesting when you watch the video of this thing to see this bridge, to see the superstructure of it behave more like a sail or like an airplane wing than a bridge deck. And if you're in, if you're an engineer and you've gone through engineering class, you know that the one thing that you don't ever want to see happen on a bridge is for it to start to move a lot. That's not good, right? We design our structures to stay put in the same place. If they're moving a lot in one direction or the other, that's not a good thing, right? That was always a joke when they made us take dynamics. If your bridge is moving, you're already in trouble. I, but that's <laughs> dynamic. That's right. We're supposed engineers are supposed to be experts in statics, not dynamics. Yes. Yeah. So, and as I said, the engineers who worked on this bridge in 1940 realized that they had a problem on their hands right away. And they were prepared to go in and try a solution to try to fix it, but they never got the chance. Um, as we move on to the next slide here... Um, and Doug Kerr is writing some really interesting stuff in the live chat, if you're not paying attention. But uh, he's 
he's got some good stuff for you as well. So check that out. I, as we go on to this slide, I love this picture in the upper right so much. You know why? Anybody? Well, we're looking from the base of one of the towers and we're looking it's straight curved. up. We're looking straight up at straight up, you know, the spine of one of the bridge towers. The amount of force that was put on this bridge when it was ripped apart was so much that it permanently bent the tower. Wow. You're you're looking at what basically is a four I I forget what the height of this bridge tower is, four or five hundred feet. And the steel is permanently bent to one side. I mean, can you imagine the amount of wind load that has to come into play and the amount of instability that the structure has to be repeatedly um, subjected to in order to do that? That's plastic, not elastic in that case. Well, at, at that point, it became plastic. Yeah, that's no longer elastic deformation, right? I mean, that's... that's uh... What, what happened with this bridge was the between the narrowness of the deck and the thinness of the deck and the length of the main span just had a resonant frequency that happened to be a frequency that worked with the wind coming through the channel. And so the reason the Whitestone Bridge went through the same thing is it was another... It was, it was at least wider. The roadway was rather wide. We're still a thin deck with a long main span, so the resonant frequency lined up with wind gusts, and thus it had similar problems for us. But they, yeah. they learned through, especially these two, when you mentioned that it's not a short span when you introduced it, that's, that's one of the keys here. They learned that you can't build a long, slender span without serious work to address aerodynamics and avoid it becoming a, a, essentially a long guitar string. Yeah. I mean, this bridge just reacted violently to, as I said, its natural length and then also the wind loads and the vibrations that ensued as part of that. And it was just a perfect combination that really this bridge was torn apart on its own without any human interference in it whatsoever. It just destroyed itself, basically. Um, and again, we really are fortunate that we have that video because it it really tells the whole story uh, without that video you would look at a picture like this and you just would be like how in the hell did this happen um, it's very sobering I gotta tell you you know even even today for for engineers to look at pictures like this it is this is scary to look at this and and realize that mother nature can do this to our structures that we design um and so from this point forward as erica and i have alluded to you know aerodynamics were taken into consideration far more than they ever were in the past and in engineering school you'll learn about all of this stuff and whereas in the past it was never really even considered um as I said, you know, some of my most memorable moments going through school involve watching clips of this bridge ripping itself to pieces. Uh, it's certainly like if you're if you do what I do for a living, if you do what we do for a living, uh, you you sure don't forget it. That's for sure. So. To finish off the story, the, the cautionary tale of cutting corners, this bridge collapses in 1940, and the, uh, the officials in Washington State and in Tacoma go back to the drawing board, and they say, well, what do we do? We have to build a new bridge, so what do we do? Well, it turns out that they actually went back to the originally submitted design, uh, which was submitted originally by an a Washington state engineer named Clark Eldridge, um, who had produced a very conventional looking suspension bridge design. Um, this was the design that he submitted in the late 1930s and was passed over in favor of the lower cost option that collapsed. 
Uh, well, guess what? His original concept was basically used for the 1950 bridge. Um, which, you know, spoiler alert, just happens to still be with us to this day. Um, it's interesting, like, it, I wonder, had they built the original design in the late 30s, um, we would not have had the episode that we had with the original bridge's collapse. But then you also wonder... You know, would Tacoma Narrows have happened elsewhere? Would there have been another suspension bridge that was built? That the Whitestone. Or it, yeah, I mean, it, it could have happened anywhere, right? You know, some other bridge might have fallen, and that would have been the one that, you know, we talk about, you know, infamously. But I, d I wonder, because if it happened to the Whitestone, it would have happened after it opened to traffic. And... Well, well, yeah, I mean, Tacoma Narrows op happened after it opened, too, but... It opened not to traffic. It just opened to very light usage in Tacoma. Whitestone, well, yeah. you'll be talking about thousands of vehicles, potentially. Well, yeah, the, the big difference there being that Whitestone is New York City. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I think it would have gone from a civil engineering lesson to a major disaster. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can't take that off the table. I mean, I, I suppose that's the silver lining here, is that Tacoma happened in a still relatively remote part of the country where... You know, nobody perished in its collapse. The, in fact, the only the only living creature that perished in the collapse of the bridge was a cocker spaniel dog. Which uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that story, but there was one car that got stuck on the bridge before it collapsed, and its driver managed to escape, but he was unable to rescue the dog that he had with him. Uh, so the dog went down with the bridge, but the the driver managed to save himself. But uh, on the subject of the 1950 bridge, I mean, they basically reverted to the original Washington State proposal from the 1930s, built a much sturdier bridge. If the 1940 bridge was nicknamed Galloping Gertie, the 1950 bridge was nicknamed Sturdy Gertie. Because, well... Are you making that up? I'm not no, I've heard that before. I'm wow. not making that up, Steve. No? Wow. Yep. Um... So we 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 learned our lesson, but it was a very you know costly and very uh, traumatic way to get to the finished product that we have. But we you know eventually built a bridge that uh, manages to s stick around with us and not be subject to collapse and high winds. The um, nineteen fifty bridge stood the test of time and it continues to to this day uh the only issue with it was that increases in traffic became an issue in the 1990s uh so the state of washington proposed building a parallel span which was completed in 2007 this is the newest american suspension bridge of significant length this uh 2007 built bridge um, which carries southbound traffic into tacoma uh, the 1950 bridge was restriped to carry northbound traffic uh, onto the peninsula. Um, the two bridges are, obviously, they're not really alike appearance-wise. There are a lot of differences in their appearance, but I do like how the 2007 newer bridge looks a lot like the original. Like They definitely put some effort into trying to complement the original bridge with the second bridge that they built. And I'll leave you with uh, this view. And visiting this site in July made me really appreciate just how big this bridge is and therefore just how big the original bridge was when it collapsed. Um, because as I said, what the 1940 bridge that collapsed, that was not a small bridge. Like maybe on the video footage you watch, maybe it doesn't look that big. But when you come here and you see it, um, this bridge was huge. I mean, it was massive. And for it to just be ripped apart in the wind the way that it was is just incredible. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is your crash course in the Tacoma Narrows Bridges.
And again, we kind of, even with the amount of detail we went into, we really only scratched the surface on the amount of information that's out there about this bridge. So um, have at it as far as doing your own research and, you know, discovering everything that you would want to know about it. <clears throat> the good old GWB, Steve. I drove over that this morning. <laughs> You're not Steve. I am now. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Floor's yours. <laughs> um, one of two <laughs> really great New York City suspension bridges in terms of their length. I know that there are others. Um, that we would consider great for other reasons. But the GWB is one of the great signature bridges of New York City. Um, really, it, it, it's also really interesting in how it was built to be expanded on in the years since its opening. So the, originally it was built with a single deck. The lower deck was added in the early 1960s. Uh, and also the upper level was originally built with six lanes and they added the center two lanes later. So now you have a total of eight lanes on the upper level. As I said, the lower level was added in the early 60s. So this they was were first. talking about a third level at one point also. <laughs> really, really? They, were, they talked about it. You know, with the factor of safety of this bridge, it, it wouldn't surprise me if it could handle it. You know? I'm sure it would be pretty wild looking if they ever did build a, a third level on that thing, but... Where would they put it? Above or below? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is it was talked about at one point, but the, the, the interesting thing about the GWB is that due to funding as I, I don't think it was wartime it's just depression funding they they for for monetary reasons they left the cladding off the bridge so that's why you can see the steel in the towers you're seeing the inner structure of the towers whereas in most suspension bridges you're seeing a finished tower look all the other ones have some sort of finished look to them this is iconic now but it was not the intent one of the other interesting things about this bridge is that because the elevation of the land is very high on both sides of the bridge, uh, you have the Palisades in New Jersey and Washington Heights in Manhattan. This bridge is, you know, most suspension bridges kind of have a, an arch shape to it because they, uh, a very gradual arch shape because they have to climb up from water level uh, to get up, up above the shipping channel. But GWB is more like just kind of straight across. Um, in fact, the Palisades are so high that on the New Jersey side, there's a pretty substantial rock cut that had to be made to get the upper, upper level across, and the lower level actually goes into a, a very short tunnel um, to get out onto land on the New Jersey side. I believe also the George Washington is the busiest uh, suspension bridge in the world in terms of traffic volume carried. And it is a very, very critical link in the East Coast transportation network. Um, it carries I-95, the East Coast's main street, and it's also uh, really the only realistic way for trucks to get onto and off of Long Island without having to go through the, the heart of New York City or traverse the BQE. <laughs> yeah, well, the GW is I-95, so it's automatically one of the more important thoroughfares in the eastern U.S. just there. And then I think you're right. I think it is the busiest not just the suspension bridge, but I think it's the busiest bridge, period, in terms of daily traffic volume. Major bridge, yes. Otherwise, you could point to some overpasses being the, the busiest. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm sure there's probably some overpass on like the 405 or the 401 or something that's busier. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true, yeah. <clears throat> Steve, would you like to talk about your experience with the bridge walk on the Mackinac? The greatest bridge in the world, according to them. It, it is pretty I, interesting. The, the one thing that I would like to say about the Mackinac is, as an engineer, I appreciate great achievements in the construction realm. Um, I've been on the front lines of some pretty interesting construction work in my, in my short career. So I, I've, I've come to really appreciate what it takes to build things of this size. Um, I would just like to say that the greatest single achievement that the Mackinac Bridge represents is the fact that they were even able to build it. When you look at where this bridge is located, between the peninsulas of Michigan, in a body of water that is pretty much frozen over solid ice four months out of the year, um, and then you have to deal with the high winds and the severe weather that come through the area, um, to me, it is a miracle that they were even able to construct this bridge in the first place. And that, to me, is the most impressive single element. There are bridges that are longer than this all across America, but none of those bridges had to deal with the environmental obstacles that this bridge had to deal with. And for that reason, this is one of the great achievements in American engineering history, just being able to build this thing. Yeah, there's definitely some pretty inhospitable conditions out there. Um, this bridge also occasionally has to shut down in the springtime just from melting ice off of the towers and the cables. Um, you know, it just gets so cold and windy that the water just freezes to the cables. And as soon as it, it gets warm, it's, uh, it starts to melt. But the, the location is absolutely spectacular. So definitely... If you have a chance to get up there to the uh, top of the Lower Peninsula and, and drive across this, it's it's definitely worth it. Um, just a very picturesque, beautiful location, especially if you get to it on a nice day. And you want to talk about like long and slender and and sleek looking. Um, it's it's almost like this can't be beat. I mean, it's a really long span. Obviously, the main span itself is is not the longest it's only the third longest but the bridge itself is pretty long but the you know just the narrow roadway and the really tall towers i mean it really it's just a really impressive drive it, the, the height of the towers is a striking feature also you're talking about an interstate highway the bridge that first of all there's no median barrier for the length of that suspension span it is a low curve and the inner lanes as you as you saw on the first slide are open metal brakes and trucks actually I forgot which lanes the trucks have to use but there are a lot of restrictions around and a lot of weight saving profile reducing measures for this bridge to be able to function at all yeah the, the inside lanes of the roadway are an open steel grate whereas the outer lanes are actually paved um and that is done intentionally to improve wind circulation through the structure. Because um, as, as you probably know, this area just, you know, it's, it's a wind tunnel most of the year. And the wind just zips right through the strait here between the lakes. And so they had to design a bridge that would be, you know, capable of handling, at times, hurricane force winds that zip through here. And... Keep in mind that this bridge was built in the years right after the Second World War. It was also built in the years right after the collapse of Tacoma Narrows. So I think that in a lot of respects, and this bridge was another design of David Steinman, who, by the way, this was his last major suspension bridge design. Really, this bridge represents his crowning achievement as an engineer. But he really... You know, I don't know if he overcompensated or not, but he certainly played it very conservative with the design of this bridge as far as um, its ability to handle high wind loads. 
Um, and we're thankful that he did so because this bridge is still with us today and I think it could at least be here for another hundred years at least. I mean, it, it is a, it's one of the closest examples we have in America to um, engineering perfection when it comes to bridge design. We've talked about in the last 30 seconds the, uh, about the idea of engineering perfection in bridges. Um, if there's a bridge that is more perfect for its location than the Mackinac Bridge in Michigan, it probably is the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, now, it, it's worth remembering that for the longest time, it was always thought that a bridge across the Golden Gate Strait at the north end of San Francisco would be an impossible undertaking. But developments in technology in the early 1900s suddenly made the venture a lot less impossible. And by golly, in 1937, when the bridge opened, it really became possible. It was no longer an impossible dream. Um, I want to focus on something that a lot of people don't really talk about with this bridge, and that is what I like to call the curious case of Strauss v. Ellis. The chief engineer of the Golden Gate Bridge was a man by the name of Joseph B. Strauss, who, from the opening of this bridge up, a, up until the dawn of the 21st century, was widely accepted as the mastermind of the design and construction of this bridge. However, he really shafted the guy who deserves most of the credit for this bridge, and that gentleman is a, name, is a guy named Charles Ellis who did most of the design work on this bridge in the 1920s and 30s. However, in 1931, probably out of jealousy, uh, Strauss fired Ellis from his position as senior design engineer, and Strauss basically took all the credit for the design. Um, it was only until the 21st century that San Franciscans and the engineering community at large finally began to acknowledge the contributions of Charles Ellis to the design of this bridge. Really, we owe, you know, this entire bridge exists today because of the input and the design work of Charles Ellis. And it's not really Joseph Strauss's contributions that made this bridge possible. Um, Ellis, in fact, even after he was fired, he continued to work unpaid countless numbers of hours on the design of this bridge because he believed in his mind that someday his real contribution would be acknowledged uh, even if it was years after his death which it, it turned out to be the case um, but uh, yeah he we have a really interesting rivalry here between Strauss and Ellis that was really not just professional in nature it appears and um but fortunately i think that we can safely say that uh we now know what really happened it, it wasn't joseph strauss that designed this bridge it was a gentleman named charles ellis who did and for the longest time joseph strauss tried to pass it off as his own design which is really not the case so that's a little bit of Golden Gate history that maybe you wouldn't have heard in most locations. Because, I mean, really, what else is there to say about this bridge? I mean, there's not much to say about it that hasn't already been said in one way or another. I mean, it's a drop-dead gorgeous structure. Um, I, I suppose the question I would like to pose to you guys is, you know, we hear talk about cities having signature bridges you know, and signature designs on things. I mean, you could make the argument that this is America's signature bridge. I would argue that the Brooklyn is just as much of a signature bridge. I, I Yeah, I think that's in the conversation, sure. Um, I might say that it's, it's a little bit of both. You know, Amer uh, the Brooklyn Bridge represents like the earlier history of the country and the Golden Gate is the more modern uh, version of it. Yeah, they're, they're both great in their own, in their own 
unique ways, right? Uh, they both represent different eras. They both represent different advances in technology and what have you. Um, you can't beat this view, though. I mean, this is... If there's a if there's a better backdrop of a suspension bridge in the United States, I'm I sure haven't seen it. I don't think um, this is about as great as it gets. On a clear day, <laughs> that's the key. On a clear day, yeah. Not when there's fog around. Although I have seen pictures of this bridge when the fog is just right and like the tops of the towers peer up above the fog. Um, that's a pretty neat sight also. You can, you can find some such views on Alps Road's very own US 101 page. Do you have pictures of it like that? I, didn't know I, have, that. I have morning fog lifting to the afternoon and yeah, all all different all different side views of the bridge from all different locations. I I definitely took too many photos of it, and I have one very similar to your photo here. So at the very bottom of the page is pretty much that photo, except better. <laughs> yeah. I would. I see people making reference to I-278 in the live chat, and um, speaking of which, it's everybody's favorite New York City suspension bridge, or it's it's up there with me. I, I would probably personally put the GWB ahead of this one because of personal uh, connections to it, but... Uh, and being spelled correctly. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you to whoever put this PowerPoint slide together for uh, spelling the name of the bridge correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this, yeah. we're at number one on the list, and I believe, I don't know if this is true or if this is just an urban legend, so I'm going to preempt what I'm about to say with that disclaimer, but so the, the original idea was that they that the chief designer of this bridge, Othmar Amon, submitted a suspension bridge design for consideration at this location. And uh, our good friend Robert Moses intervened, Robert Moses being the arterial coordinator and planner for the city of New York in the expressway era after World War II. He intervened and said, well, no, I want the world's longest suspension bridge to be in New York City, not in San Francisco. So he sent the design team back to the drawing board and they came up with a suspension bridge that was longer than the Golden Gate. I, th I think there was a tunnel proposed here also as an alternative. Yeah, so the, the tunnel idea, if we want to talk about that, that goes back even further than the 1950s. I think there was talk about putting a subway tunnel under the harbor between Brooklyn and Staten Island. There was talk about building a vehicle tunnel in the 1930s, I think. Um, none of those proposals went anywhere. <clears throat> there was also a, a plan for an earlier suspension bridge from about the 1920s. Uh, that never got off the ground either. It wasn't until the 1950s that we really started to see movement on building a fixed bridge between Staten Island and the rest of New York City. Um, and that culminated, of course, with the construction of the bridge that we see today. Again, I don't know if the urban legend is true, but it sure makes for a nice story, at least. Um, so the Verrazano is the United States' longest suspension bridge with a center span of 4,260 feet. It therefore represents what I believe is the queen suspension bridge of new york as we've as we've seen there are quite a few of them in the city of new york alone but the verrazano is the largest of them all so fun fact about that actually the verrazano's is so long that the towers aren't actually parallel they actually had to take account the curvature of the earth in uh, and slightly skew them yeah i think the towers are a few inches further apart at the top than they are at their base. Yeah. Isn't that right? 
Yes. And so that has something to do with how you would design that bridge. Like as yes. far as like the, the, the way that you would design the cables and the loadings and all that stuff, that stuff mm-hmm. gets skewed a little bit because the towers aren't necessarily parallel to each other. Better hope you're really good at trig. Erica, I hope you're really good at trig. <laughs> the, nervous, the nervous laugh. Uh, <laughs> I think so. I, I don't do suspension bridges. It's okay. I don't have to deal with this. You really should get into suspension bridges. I should. They look hard. <laughs> this is my fault. That's my fault. Hard but fun. <laughs> so this this is my favorite New York City suspension bridge. I'd say for many years when I was growing up, it was the GW, but I don't know. There's something I just really like about like the, it's simplistic, but yet like, not like the Walt Whitman simplistic. It's, it's still got some, I mean, and it's in a really spectacular location too, at kind of the entrance to New York city, both if you're coming in by ship and a lot of cruise ships actually, pass under the bridge on their way into and out of New York and also for me just um, ever since I started going to college down south uh, the Verrazano kind of represented the uh, re-entry to my hometown of uh, Long Island and New York City area but it is a very like just sleek and simple span um it really does its job well also because it's one of the few bridges in New York City that is, relatively speaking, uncongested. Um, and that, I think, is just because it has six lanes in each direction and plus an HOV lane during rush hour. But, um, you know, the Verrazano, the, any traffic you hit is always going to be on the approaches, especially those curvy uh, Belt Parkway ramps. But whereas most of the other bridges, the bridge itself is the traffic bottleneck. Yeah, and I should emphasize that like the GWB, there are two levels of traffic on the Verrazano. Um, Although what's different in this case is that the lower level superstructure was built with the original bridge in the 1960s. Um, Whereas with the GWB, they built the lower level completely separately in a separate project. The the superstructure for the lower level was built with the original bridge. Um, and then simply they just added a roadway to it and striped it and opened it in the late 60s. Um, when they built this bridge, they, they had the foresight to know that this bridge was probably going to need a lower level for traffic, but they anticipated it not being necessary for many years after it opened. Well, it turns out that Within five years of the bridge's opening in 1964, they had opened the lower level to traffic. So the the rush of demand came far sooner than they anticipated. But thankfully, they built this bridge. Uh, they engineered it in such a way that they could add those additional lanes later if necessary. I would like to make one other comment about this bridge um, regarding its name. Um the bridge was always known from its early proposals in the 1920s up until the 1950s. It was known as the Narrows Bridge, simply. Uh, the Verrazano name came later as an attachment during construction. There was a late push in 1964 to have this bridge named in honor of John F. Kennedy um, due to his assassination in November of 63. Um, but that ended up not coming to pass, and the bridge was ultimately dedicated as the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in November of 64. And with that, folks... I I didn't want to uh, interrupt you before, but the interesting thing for me as a highway designer, as we recently added the seven reversible lane across the upper level and reconfigured the interchange on the east side, we had a chance to go back to some of the original plans and we saw the interchange on the east side how they left various ramp stubs for the interchange that, for the Belt Parkway interchange 
when they actually built out the lower level and connected it, it didn't line up perfectly. There was one ramp stub that they didn't use, and they routed the ramp a different way. So it was, it was interesting to see that they already changed their mind on the original plan within a few years. <clears throat> Yeah, and, yeah. It, and as Mike said, you know, that bridge is certainly not the choke point anymore. It's the approach expressways on either end. But that's another discussion for another webinar, I'm sure. Yeah, and a couple of people have alluded to the, the joke about the number of Zs in the Verrazano's name. Um, Verrazano, the explorer, Giovanni di Verrazano, who is a, a, an Italian like me, um, he had two Z's in his name, and some folks in New York City decided to shorten the name to just have one Z because they assumed it would be pronounced exactly the same, and it would take a fairly long name and make it a little bit shorter, which would make the road signs for it a little bit smaller. But some people um, took issue with that. Uh, some more than others, but um, there were some <laughs> people who uh, who really, really took exception to the fact that uh, the name of the bridge was not spelled just like the real uh, explorer's uh, name spelling. So they petitioned uh, New York City, and um, they ended up renaming it officially to add the second Z. So if you look very closely, older road signs will have one Z, and the newer ones will have two. And it's I, I have looked this up and provided a link that provides some historical evidence about one Z versus two. There are other items in New York City spelled with a single Z, and at the time, at least in the '60s, the thinking was the spelling was ambiguous. There were probably sources that had one Z versus two, just like when you look at Tunnelly Avenue in Jersey City. There, one L or two is a source of eternal debate that is never settled. So, I think in the '60s they considered Verrazano the same way, and then more recently they seem to have settled on believing that two Z's is the correct version. Well, hey, in 50 years it'll have three Z's. So, I I, I expect that. I do love how they never question the number of R's though. For some reason, Z is a chosen letter. <clears throat> Well, we've come to the end of the PowerPoint show for tonight. We'd be happy to take your questions and comments in the live chat if you have any. Um, no, we'd be angry. Yeah, well, I can be angry at the fact that Steve and Erica have never really figured out their audio problems all night. But we've made the I thought most we solved of it now. I, is it, is it, you guys really didn't ever really get it together, but it's okay. This isn't good. We, we, you made can hear it, me now. we made the most of it. It's okay. Next time I'll go to my house and use my, you know, working computer. It's or okay. You, or just... you could do that, too. That's fine. Erica, I hope you know where the microphone is on your computer. I do. All right. Well, that's probably something to keep in mind for next time. We can, we can just be angry about it. It's okay. It, it's just what we do, you know. What can you say? Uh, so if anybody has any questions, you know, they can feel free to drop them in the live chat for the next few minutes. Uh, we'd be happy to take them. Guys, uh, are you in a hurry to get out of here, or do you have time to stick around yeah. for a little bit of video? No, I have yeah. time. I'm not. Um, acknowledging Doug's uh, comment in the chat, yes, I have several bottles of Verrazano wine uh, in my kitchen. Verrazano, pronounce it correctly. Eh, what is nah. Yeah. Are you are you using, you're not pronouncing it correctly if you're not using hand motions too. Who says I'm not? No, I, I do. I'm using hand motions. <laughs> you just making, can't I'm see making them. certain hand gestures now. Yeah. Um also a reminder if you're enjoying the programming so far in season three, we have another nice presentation for you coming up next Saturday. As we check out the roads and toll roads around Charlotte, North Carolina. We hope you can join us for that. I know Steve is very angry that he can't be a part of this because he would love to tell us about toll road stuff. I would love to talk about my experience on Charlotte City Route 4. 
but I think you'll have some good panelists to discuss that. So. Uh, I hope to have at least one Charlotte resident on the panel for that one. Who I believe had driven it, so. I, I would hope so, yeah. All right. Steve, when's your party? Now. Do you have to leave now? I'm leaving now. All right, well, you can leave, and then, um... Eric, does, need that, does that mean you're leaving, too? Like, what's your deal? I think I get kicked out when he leaves. Okay. Mike, are you sticking around, or what? what's your deal? I can stick around for a few more minutes. All right. Um... Well, we can we can uh, keep Mike around, Steve. If you gotta go, then you do what you gotta do. But um, thanks for joining us. And um, I would just like to play a couple of videos here while while we still have some time here. Um, Tacoma. Well, we could do that too <laughs> if you want. I mean, it's so iconic. We talked about it so much. Yeah. Well, we can do that. Um, I'll, I'll show you the, um, the north, both, both spans of the bridge while I got the video open. And by the way, all the video that I'm showing you guys is available on my channel already. Um, so if you're interested to see more footage of these and many other bridges across the United States, um, feel free to check out the channel library. There's, there's an endless amount of content. Uh, for you guys to explore and check out. Um, so yeah, the, obviously we spent so much time talking about Tacoma Narrows that we kind of have to show you the drive across these two bridges, the parallel spans. Uh, the first one we're, we're traveling across is the 1950 bridge uh, in this video. As I said, this bridge became affectionately known as Sturdy Gertie after its completion in the 1950s. Um, quite the contrast from its counterpart that collapsed about 10 years earlier. Uh, but you'll notice as you cross this bridge that this bridge has an open steel grating between the lanes, like where the lane dividers are. Um, and this was, again, another, another conservative approach by engineers to uh, help wind movement um, around the structure. So at, at no point in this bridge's history has it technically been legal to change lanes while you're crossing it. Uh, you'll see the way that the lanes are striped on this bridge uh, prohibits passing or prohibits yeah. lane changes. Perhaps by state law, but not according to the MUTCD. Um, if it were to be completely MUTCD compliant, those would be double white lines. But some states say no crossing a solid line, period, single or double. And I'm assuming Washington State is one of them. Plus, they have the big regulatory sign before the bridge, do not change lanes on bridge. Well, yeah, that big white sign does does tell you something also. It's interesting that that is the case for the um, only the northbound bridge. The southbound bridge, which was built much later, does not have the same uh, issue as far as lane changing. Um, it's also a much it's also a much more modern structure, so they don't have to worry about that necessarily. Relevant to both this and the uh, Mackinac Bridge in Michigan. Um, those steel grates can get pretty darn slippery. So the um, I could see someone who's used to driving in slick conditions on solid pavement if their wheels suddenly hit the metal grate for just a short period of time and only on one side of the vehicle. That could certainly cause some vehicle stability issues. Yeah, yeah. I've definitely heard stories of, from Mackinac especially about... Uh... You know, just the wind tossing cars around, and then if it's raining or snowing, then that, that just adds another whole dimension into the mix, for sure. Yeah, I would not want to be in that left lane of the Mackinac on a windy or rainy day. 
Well, I I wouldn't either, but I got stuck on that thing during a high wind event uh, in September of 2020 when I went up there. Because um, when I visited the Upper Peninsula, a cold front had just passed through, and by the time I turned around to go back to the Lower Peninsula, the, the winds were, I think they were gusting to like 50 or 60 miles an hour at one point. And... Um, I, I'm sure you know that they they have escort vehicles for situations like that when they just yeah they can only take a few cars at a time across that bridge in high winds so they kind of caravan them all behind an escort vehicle and um, that was an interesting experience having to having to go through that yeah I know some bridges like the Bay Bridge. Uh, near Annapolis, they will shut down when winds get above a certain speed. And it's a speed that I'd say it's not frequent, but it's not infrequent either. It, it happens a couple of times a year where they'll actually have to shut down the bridge. And, you know, I know we had a little bit of a debate over whether bridges should move or shouldn't move. And, um, you know, I, I think in general the bridges should move a little bit but not a lot. And the problem is when it gets really windy, they'll, they'll move quite a bit. And that is actually okay. I mean, the bridge is flexing and it's absorbing all the energy that the wind is putting on it, but it's such a bumpy, bouncy ride that vehicles could lose control. So they don't actually want vehicles on it under those conditions. Yeah. That, that, that's the key that, you know, bridges are designed to be flexible um, you don't want them to be too flexible, like in the case of the first Tacoma Narrows, but you want them right. to be able to be stable, you know, and to be able to, you know, work with the conditions and work with the wind forces and all that so that, you know, the bridge, you know, kind of moves with the forces that are being applied to it rather than just being ripped apart by them, um, so that's the key. Like there, there's a fine balancing act that you have to find uh, when you're designing a suspension bridge like this. And Mackinac is again, it's a, it's another key example of designing a suspension bridge for those extreme forces while still being able to really carry traffic throughout those wind events and also be a damn impressive looking bridge additionally yeah i was in awe the first time i crossed the mackinaw oh, i was too yeah we're watching this was the first uh this was the first trip i took over that bridge the video we're watching right now and um this was one of those bridges I had always read about and I had pictures of when I was growing up, but I, I had never seen it in person. And, you know, when you, when you see this bridge in person, it, it is just, it's enormous. Um, it's just awe inspiring really. And like most of these bridges have that effect on you, but, um, this one, this one did more than most for me. Um, I, I can't pinpoint exactly why, but, I was really impressed. Yeah, and so as I said before, with the the left lanes on the on the bridge, the center lanes being that open grate, um, you kind of see how that is laid out on this bridge, where there isn't there isn't really a proper center divider either. Um, what you have in the middle here is really just a glorified curb uh, separating traffic. Um, I'm also really surprised that the that the edge barriers on this bridge are not higher than they are. Because um, I, I know that there have been examples in the past of trucks or high-profile vehicles just, you know, either going off the bridge entirely or coming pretty damn close to it. Uh, so I'm a little surprised that those railings on the edge don't extend higher than they do. Um I don't know if that's something that's been considered in the past or if they're looking into it now, but that's that's something that I was a little surprised by when I crossed it myself. Yeah, I'm sure barrier standards have changed a lot between now and when it was originally designed. And I'm 
also pretty sure they had to take wind loading into account with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's, it's an open barrier as a, obviously a, like a Jersey wall style solid barrier would be preferable from a crash perspective. Mm -hmm. But also I would... prefer the, I prefer the open barrier from a view perspective and oh, an aesthetic. Sure. Perspective. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, the first time I crossed this, it was 4th of July weekend in 2017, and I, I really felt like I didn't get to enjoy it very much because I had my camera out and was trying to snap pictures the whole way across. <laughs> and yeah. the, because, it was, because it was a holiday weekend, the traffic was pretty brutal, so it wasn't like I could just turn around and go back and try again. Uh -huh. Tra traffic on this bridge is definitely limited by the toll plaza and not by either the bridge or the approach roads. Um, on peak times because they don't take any kind of nationally recognized toll transponder. They used to have um, almost like an office building access card type system that was called MacPass. Um, yeah. Now they recently went to transponders, but it's only, only good on this particular bridge. That's right. Yeah. So MacPass only applies on this bridge and it is, not a it's not usable on any other bridge it's so like you can't use it out of state and um you can't use tags such as easy pass or some other more common toll tag in the eastern u.s uh on the Mackinac bridge so th this is one of the few bridges that i've actually had to pay cash for when uh, paying a toll yeah, no, it's wrong. usually not an issue. It's only an issue during holiday weekends, but of course I was there on holiday weekend when it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and MacPass is definitely not uh, friendly for infrequent users because they, uh, I don't know what the deal is, they make you load at least $80 onto your account that's non-refundable. But oh, if you're really? a commuter, it's actually a pretty good deal because what you do is you pay the full toll going one way across and then if you take a return trip within, I think it's 72 hours, it's free. Oh, okay. Hmm. So if you're commuting, it's a 50% discount. Hmm. Otherwise, you're paying full price, but you gotcha. can zip through. Well, speaking of tolls, we just went through another toll plaza as we, uh, as we check out the Bay Bridge. I want to play this video in full because it's going to include the... As we cross from Oakland into San Francisco, we pass the uh, the eastern span, the self-anchored suspension span, and then we pass the, the, the double suspension bridge at the end. But um, I would say, Mike, from an entrance into a city standpoint, this is right up there near the top of the list with me. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've experienced... The Fort Pitt Tunnel and Bridge into Pittsburgh uh, many times over the years. Uh, I, I think the Bay Bridge is right up there with you know best entrances into a major American city. What do you think? Yeah, I would tend to agree uh, for sure. Um, and the thing I always liked about both the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge and the George Washington is that it, it's both they're basically more or less close enough uh both ends of i-80 and you know it's i-80 is maybe not one of the most exciting interstates in its entirety when driving across the country but uh the endpoints certainly make up for it because you just you get a pretty impressive entrance into new york city going east and you get an absolutely spectacular entrance into san francisco going west that is true you know I-80 is boring as hell across Wyoming and Nebraska and all those other plain states and even like in Indiana and Ohio. But, um, man, it's sure at each end you are treated to a heck of a finish. Um, certainly here in San Francisco and then 80 in New Jersey ends, you know, just a stone's throw away from the George Washington Bridge. But um, in each case, I mean, it's it's an absolute uh, thrill to 
enter a major American city in the fashion that you do in each case. You know, the the self-anchored suspension span here, it, you know, it, it kind of looks like you're passing through a spaceship or something. Like, there's nothing else that looks like it. Um, very futuristic design to it. And, um, and I am actually serious when I say that I can't wait to see how this thing performs in an earthquake. I know they've done the engineering and the computer modeling on this thing, but I, I'm actually really interested to see how this thing actually performs someday. Nothing, nothing beats the real world experience. That's true. You can, you can put your designs through any simulator you want, but you can never fully simulate the real world, especially when it comes to earthquakes. But you come out of the tunnel at mid span and you're greeted to this view of a of a great suspension bridge and there's the skyline of San Francisco off to your right. Yeah, I do like the the towers with the X's, um, that design, which is very much like the eastbound span of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. So it's two bay bridges kind of have a, a little bit in common there. That's true, yeah. And the thing is, once you get past the first two towers on this western leg of the Bay Bridge, you're like, oh, wow, I still got another bridge ahead of me. Yeah, you're only halfway across. Like, you just cross this huge bridge, and you're like, well, wait a second. There's still half of a bridge to go. Um, so this is what I mean when I say that you, you get two suspension bridges for the price of one, because each of these two bridges that are end-to-end, -end, um, they're huge in their own right. But you put them end to end, and that's, you know, then you really got something special on your hands. And then the self anchored span before it, I mean, it's add all three of them up, and it's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's why I, it's why I maintain that this is the single most impressive uh, complex of bridges in San Francisco. Um, from an so, engine... okay, so my, my way of, of making that determination, I think. My favorite suspension bridge to drive across in San Francisco would be the Bay Bridge, but my favorite to look at from far away would probably be Golden Gate. Yeah, I, I would probably come to the same conclusion, um, just because I think that the Golden Gate is probably the single most scenic location we've ever dropped a major bridge in America. Um, and the fact that the Golden Gate just looks great, it, it just looks perfect for the location that it's in. Um, to me, I, I, I would tend to agree with you on that. Um, my judgment of these two bridges, I look at it from the engineering and construction angle. Um, so I, I tend to not really get into the, you know, the scenic and the sentimentality angle of it, but, um, there's certainly there's certainly a case to be made both ways, I think. And um I don't know, in this particular case I, I tend to fall on the Bay Bridge side of the ledger. When it comes to the engineering uh angle of it all. I'm with you on the scenic level of it. You know, I, I think the Golden Gate is certainly the more scenic of the two, but um I certainly, when I when I look at the engineering that went into the Bay Bridge, man, it's hard to top that. I mean, I if I if you told me that I had to settle for the Golden Gate Bridge, man, I I'd, I'd take that in a second. <laughs> you know, it, it's hard to it's hard to argue against the Golden Gate. Um, that that's another really special creation of ours. And and keep in mind too that you know, the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate were built basically at the same time, and they were opened within a year of each other. Um, they were built practically simultaneously in the mid 1930s. So, San Francisco was really the the global epicenter of long span bridge technology there, like during the Great Depression, which is really really amazing to think about they were building both of those bridges at the same time 
Yeah, and they both withstood the test of time, um, both the bridges themselves and the design, because, uh, as you pointed out, San Francisco is one of the only places in the country still building suspension bridges. It's in their DNA, right? You know? I mean, you got these two bridges on your roster. You can, you know, you've got a body of work there that you can just keep adding on to. And there's a certain, there's a certain amount of experience, I think, that, that comes with that. And there's a certain amount of confidence that you build from having built bridges of this type in, in earthquake country. Um, I just think it makes building long span bridges that much easier in a, in a way. I'll play one more video for you guys before we sign off uh, for the evening. Um, I want to circle back to New York City. And again, as I as we blabber on here about suspension bridges, um, all of these videos that I'm playing for you guys are available on my YouTube channel. Just use the search engine and you know you can you can find just about any long span bridge in America. I've I've covered most of them, not all of them necessarily, but the vast majority of them I think I've covered by now. Um, so you can check out these videos uh, on the channel on your own time. But uh, I think we should conclude with one of our mutual favorite bridges, Mike, and that is the Verrazano Bridge, which, by the way, at the time of the filming of this video was still spelled with one Z, so, apologize. so apologies to everybody for, you know, us getting the spelling wrong in these uh, in this video here, but that's okay. It was correct at the time. Uh, I mean, it was correct at the time, right, yeah. Uh, by the way, I took advantage of the... Um, the COVID-19 lockdown in New York City to get footage of this bridge, this crossing. So that explains why there was no traffic in this video. But yeah, this, this bridge may not be as beautiful and artistic expression as the Golden Gate is, but man, is this, an, is this a majestic bridge or what? I mean, it is just incredible to drive across um still blows my mind even to this day driving this thing um as a as a civil engineer in the construction realm i have to be very grounded in my work while i'm on the clock and i have to you know be very you know methodical and very uh, objective in the work that i do but off the clock, I still manage to geek out about certain things. And, you know, when I drive this bridge and I, and I take it all in from an angle like this, it, it still blows my mind to this day. Yeah, and I'm definitely really interested in the historical aspects and impacts of bridges uh, like that. And just, you know, that was probably one of the single biggest things that happened in the second half of the 20th century to New York City. I mean, essentially, before the bridge was open, Staten Island was like the ugly stepchild of New York City's boroughs, uh, because getting to it was so difficult. But now you can uh, connect to the rest of New York City. And with the new bus HOV lane they built, you can buses have a path to get commuters into Manhattan relatively efficiently. <clears throat> that that was really a game changer for Staten Island. And also, I mean, even just regular Long Islanders. Um, my dad used to, when he was growing up as a little kid, before the Verrazano opened, he would take family trips out to Ohio to go visit family. And they would they would have to go down Canal Street across Manhattan to get out of the city to go south. Um, you couldn't couldn't uh, drive across Staten Island, which is almost unthinkable nowadays. <laughs> yeah, we take that for granted nowadays, right? Um, but yeah, 
just in the, just one of many examples of how these huge bridges have really altered the landscapes of our cities for better or for worse um we might want to have that debate separately some other time but um it's really been fun to chronicle all these bridges for you guys tonight um i thank you all for joining us we went very late with this presentation by the way i apologize for that while well, you just have more to catch up on if you missed any of this stuff um mike uh you have any closing remarks you'd like to make before we sign off um i'd say mostly that you know i don't i don't really do any kind of bridge design but uh, for a living but uh, i i'm just in awe of the uh the impressive amount of effort that went into designing and constructing these these bridges and i was really lucky when i was in college my intro to structural engineering class was actually taught by a professor who had PhDs in both civil engineering and history. So he essentially taught us the history of civil engineering. And we covered a lot of these bridges in, in great amounts of detail and just the, you know, the artistic design elements and the style and, and things like that. But these are, these represent, I think the best crowning achievements of, of civil engineers. And I'm, you know, always in awe every time I drive over one of these bridges. So Thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. Well, the pleasure was mine, Mike. I know this is one that you expressed interest in very early on, so I, I felt like I had to have you. So uh, it was great to have you. It was great to have Steve and Erica, even though uh, their microphone didn't work for most of the night, but uh, whatever. I think you get the gist of what they were trying to say. Um, so it was great to, to have this panel of engineers to kind of talk bridges for three hours. This was a lot of fun and, uh, I'm glad we could do another episode like this and, uh, hope, hope you guys have enjoyed this episode and thank you for watching. And, uh, if you like to see more bridge stuff, there's more stuff in the webinars folder on my channel. Um, so you can check that out and we hope to see you on the next, uh, episode that you tune in for. We'll be right back here next Saturday with another episode. So with that, I think we're going to sign off. And from all of us here, thank you all very much for watching. Uh, we hope to see you again on another episode. So until then, we're signing off. Have a good night. Have a good weekend. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. All that stuff if we don't speak until then. We'll talk to you again later. <laughs>